uh, an agreement on when we would hear it and when it can be discussed. Um, I've, it was asked uh, asked for clarification from the proposer and seconder as to whether they wished it circulated. Uh, yeah. Sorry, thank, uh, thanks, Provost. It's uh, Pauline Councillor Winchester here because I'm the proposer. Uh, we've been in discussions and we're going to go through with it. So could we have it circulated, please? Uh, could Democratic Services uh, email that straight away to the members? Oh, I will, Provost, yeah. I propose to continue with the meeting and up to the point at which we consider uh, the uh, uh, agenda for today, so right up to the minutes and then a, a break for this motion to be considered by members. Declarations of interest. You should declare any financial and non-financial interest that you have in any item of business for consideration, identifying the relevant agenda item and the nature of that interest. Deputations, there being none, we move to minutes. The minutes of Midlothian Council. Are there any matters arising? There being none. Questions to the Council Leader. The question from Councillor Parry, you've received a commercial in confidence private reply. All councillors have received this. Um, I'm conscious that uh, this is a private reply to what was a public question and some of the items touched on in the reply are already in the public domain and some might be construed to be. Uh, clearly some are not and some are commercial in confidence. I'd like to ask Mr Turpey as to uh, what extent councillors uh, may draw on the documents being circulated when discussing the matter with community councils and other interested members of the public. Thank you, Provost. Uh, it is in terms of the Council's Code of Conduct, it's important that uh, it's only those items which require to be in confidence that that, sh that, uh, that need to be just kept in confidence. So in terms of openness, um, it is useful if you can separate out those parts which are currently in the public domain and aren't subject to confidentiality, then these can be discussed with community councils, with constituents, with whomever you so require. The danger is that you've got to make sure that you do this confidential, the confidential nature of those parts which are commercial and confidence share. But yes, it, it, there's no need for a blanket ban on any discussion with uh, your stakeholders, but it's just a case of making sure that we don't accidentally release those parts which are in confidence. So the, the uh, items within that document about future consultation, those I would guess are, are entirely at liberty and can be can be communicated to other members of the public. Yes, and as part of the council's, I suppose, transparency, it, it's very helpful to let people know that these consultations are coming, that they can be ready for them and they can do the research and not be caught out with what can be occasionally a, a challenging timescale to, to respond in. Thank, thank you. At uh, uh, this point, could I ask Democratic Services whether they've been able to distribute the emergency motion? I've just circulated it, Provost. Can I uh, suggest uh, five minutes for us to have a look on our systems and uh, have a read of the emergency motion? Provost, I've got a question about the private information that we've all been disclosed. It doesn't indicate anywhere on the answers or responses exactly which one is a uh, confidential and not to be disclosed. So I may not think the answer is to be private and confidential, whereas another councillor may think it is private and confidential. I think we need absolute clarity on what can and cannot be disclosed. Thank, Thank you. you. Could, could I let that one go to the wicket keeper and, and, and ask Mr Turpey if it's possible for him to send a, a note to councillors indicating which parts are sensitive and which are not? Certainly, sure. I'll, I'll take that that task on following the this meeting. Councillor Parry. Thanks, Provost. Um, just an attempt to be helpful. I wonder if it would be easier to send 
um, a reply which redacts out any of the commercially sensitive information while just simply leaves in anything that's able to be uh, discussed and digested publicly. Uh, can I ask Mr Turpey if his black pen is in good order? Um, I will certainly work with colleagues. Chair, I don't have a redaction tool in my software, but yeah, we can get a redacted version sent out and members can then have both versions in front of them and be able to tell which bit is which. Thank you. Um, my proposal is that we consider the emergency motion at quarter past 11. Well, Mr. Could I just ask for an update? Um, obviously, yeah. it's a first. <coughs> well, Mr. I'm, I'm unaware <coughs> that such a job adverts went out. The discussions I had with the, the, the chief executive was around support for the political groups or what was seen as a lack of continuity. Uh, 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 and the, the, the groups have, for example, you're the person supporting the Conservative groups retired and I don't know if they've been replaced yet, if they are, I'm yet aware of it. And one yeah. week we'll have one person supporting us, the next week we'll have somebody else supporting us, the next again we get somebody and there's no crossover. And the discussions I've had, I had expected that any um, advert to go out would have been discussed with other, uh, other group leaders, and uh, maybe something that sure came to the group leaders actually, but actually yeah. The, 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 the business manager wasn't just to support the political groups, it was also to support the, the, uh, the new heads of service as well, which was, I thought, one of their main functions. Maybe the chief executive can clarify that for us. Yeah, and, and that you're somewhat preempting the discussion of the motion it, it, it itself, and it, it, there may be an element of uh, unfortunate wording in the job advertisement, but uh, I, I'd like to give just a few minutes to councillors to read what's, what's being proposed before we head towards the discussion and uh, solution.
Uh, unless any councillors require more time, I'm proposing that we uh, commence this emergency motion uh, and call on Councillor Winchester to speak to a motion. Thank you, Provost. It, um, we included this as an emergency motion as in the job advert that um, to do with this post. It was stated that um, they will be seen next week from the 30th of August to decide who's got the job. Um, as background, in 2018, a decision was taken at the, at the Business Transformation Steering Group, which is cross-party, to reduce the cost of admin support to the groups. Um, now we find that a job is advertised to support the council leader and the group, um, and it's been advertised without any discussion. It is in, in fact, it states that it is a reinstatement of the position, and this is stated in the My Job Scotland advert. Um, six months before an election, we think this is um, unfair to other groups but also the fact that this is a starting pay of £39,917 um, and would like to know where the cost saving is and where the parity is. And what we're asking is that the recruitment of this post is put on hold until cross-party agreement is, is achieved through the Business Transformation Steering Group and Council. And I'm asking for the support of councillors for this emergency motion. Thank you, Councillor Minister and Councillor Cassidy seconding. Yes, Chair, uh, I'd like to second this. Uh, to say I was stunned when I seen this advert would be an understatement. As uh, Councillor Winchester points out, six months before council elections, and it looks like there's a, a personal um, assistant being employed for the leader of the council, but reading this uh, this advert, I mean, for £40,000, I'd expect a NASA research scientist, not somebody that's going to support a little council like uh, probably the smallest administration in Scotland. Um, I just I feel it's completely disproportionate. My research is done every day when I open my emails and read my constituents' complaints, which equate to potholes and roads, winds not being lifted, stuff like that. We are not parliament. We are not big time players. We're small time councillors who look after our constituents. And we need to remember this. I mean, I've worked to the average pothole repair costs £40 between uh, 30 and 70 pounds. So averaging that, that's a thousand potholes that we could be repairing in Midlothian for that fee. So I wholeheartedly disagree with this position. Uh, we as an SNP group had someone at the very beginning, but after six months the girl resigned and we've been more or less, with the help of Sandra in the interim, looking after our own uh, business and we are the largest group in the council now. So yes, I do uh, I do object to this. Can I ask Councillor Milligan and then Councillor Parry? Yeah, Provost, just to, to, to reiterate, um, certainly in any discussions I've had, um, this was a business manager <coughs> um, to help oversee um, the support for elected members. As, as Colin says, um, the, the support that, that they had, um, the, the, the girl that was supporting them left, and as such they've been using um, um, support assistance, I think it went through Kevin Anderson, and I think it's the same person that's now supporting all three political groups right across the, the board. <coughs> um, unfortunately, if she's off on holiday, then there, there, there's virtually no support at all, it changes on a weekly basis. Um, but again, I'll come back to the fact that my understanding was is that as business manager, one of their main tasks was to support the two new heads of service that were coming in for, for development and to coordinate the support across um, the, 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 the political groups. I'd also make the point that, that the, the, the support that the, the administration have had, uh, um, obviously um, we have some that's long term ill at the moment that it's been off. So the reality is the three groups have effectively been relying on one person 
um, to support them. Um, so uh, that, that was as much as I knew that, and I'm quite happy that uh, it goes away for further discussion. Thank you. That, that's helpful. I think the problem is it was advertised as if it was a, a pol political officer. Um, Councillor Parry. Yeah, um, I'm sure the council leader does want it to go away. Um, however, it has been out there and it has been out um, in the public sphere. And, and um, the question that I wanted to ask was, given that it quite clearly states in the advert that it is a political appointment, um, and perhaps it's a question for um, for legal team, has there been any breach of um, the code of conduct or standards um, for councillors in this instance, given that it does appear to be a political appointment? I think I'll let that one go to Mr Turpey, who possibly will have to ponder the matter. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think this, uh, this was, a, the advert was placed by officers, and there's no question of any councillor having direct input here. And as such, then it probably makes the question of whether the Code of Conduct has been breached academic, to an extent it's the Code of Conduct, you know. Um, the council can provide support for, for members. Um, obviously, council resources shouldn't be used for political purposes, but admin support for the councillors and for the political groups of the council is ex is acceptable as long as it is to carry out their functions as councillors. Um, so that would fit in within the terms of uh, the use of council facilities. In this regard, I think it's unfortunate the wording of the advert, but uh, again, that was not, as far as I'm aware, imposed by any councillor. That was a an officer error, uh, as such. Yeah. Um, so I think, Mr. Turpey, don't officers have a duty to be impartial as well? Yes, Jim. Um, officers do have a duty in terms of the council code of conduct. So I, I don't. Perhaps I miss it. May have misunderstood Councillor Parry's question, but it was about the councillor council code of conduct or the councillor's code of conduct. Obviously, officers, if it's an officer matter that's within terms of the Council Code of Conduct, I don't wish, wouldn't wish to give an answer regarding that in the public forum, because obviously that would be a matter then to be looked at in terms of uh, the Chief Executive as as Head of Paid Service to look at what has been. So we'll leave that question on the blackboard. Uh, could I uh, revert to Councillor Winchester and then Councillor Hackett? Thank you, Provost. Um, yes, I understand that it may have been um, worded incorrectly. I don't accept that. However, um, I'm sure that, well, I hope that an advert isn't put into papers or into onto My Job Scotland without someone checking it at least. Now, the problem with this is that the closing date has passed and interviews were due to be held from next Monday. So the people who have applied for this post have applied on the terms of the advert. And that was to support the council leader and the group. Thank you. And Councillor Hackett. Thanks, Provost. Is it possible from officers to get some clarity on what is exactly in the advert because I can't seem to find it online and we have speculation here on what it is in a political motion um, that it's to support the leader and the Labour group. We have the leader of the council explaining that the position was different. We have another councillor saying it was advertised as a political appointment and there's no evidence of that. It might be the case that it's a an appointed politically sensitive post, which is a clarification on the Local Government Act. But I don't know if uh, the Chief Executive is able to furnish us with a copy just to be sure how this was advertised, because I'm not entirely convinced it is how SNP and Conservative councillors are trying to portray it. Thank you. Uh, yeah, my, un my understanding, having checked, is the advert has been taken down because it's no longer current, but it is available on Google uh, uh, in a sort of archived form, and it does indeed bear the, the bias that's, that's being suggested. And I think Mr. Turpey has rather con confirmed that. Uh, Councillor, uh, 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 have Grace Vickers first and then Councillor Cassidy. Um, thank you, Provost. 
Um, so I'm more than happy that um, this is discussed in, in full at BTSG because as members have expressed, there is really a shortage of admin support. In terms of wording, you'll also see an advert for a business manager that's the wording. We're looking for an executive business manager to support the executive director and chief officer in the delivery of the council's strategic aims. That was the formal wording that's been signed off. I do appreciate Councillor Winchester and Cassidy. There is another advert um, that does not say that. Um, so we're more than happy not to progress the one of which the wording of the motion is about and to have further discussion at, at BTSG. Um, Fiona and um, Morag who are on the call here really desperately need um, that support and I, I do appreciate um, what elected members are saying so we're more than happy to pause that, have a full discussion at BTSG and um, because the business manager role would be to support the full function of the council um, and this will be within funds that we already have. However, we wanted to to pick up on another conversation at BTSG just about wider support and admin review and um, given that we've had a couple of people retire it would be timely just to get that support put in place. I do fully understand what the two councillors are saying so I'm more than happy to pause that recruitment and have the discussion at BTSG where we have cross-party members who could agree what you want going forward and the one that's worded um, to support the um, executive director and chief officer in the delivery of council strategic officers is the one that would remain online for recruitment. Yes, that's a, a second appointment at a salary of 50,000. Is, uh, is that right? Yes, and that one, in, uh, the wording further down, that's to support mainly um, the delivery of all of the education and children's services functions as part of Fiona's admin review. And Fiona may want to come in to say more about that. OK, we have uh, Councillor Cassidy and Councillor Winchester, and then perhaps we can wind up this debate as I sense there's some sort of consensus emerging here. Uh, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just in reply to Councillor Hackett, uh, I, I don't like his remarks about this is, we're politicising this, uh, more or less accusing us. We are bringing a bona fide complaint about our uh, motion about something that is written down in black and white. And until Councillor Hackett gets a view of that, I'd advise him, strongly advise him, to keep his opinions under control. Thank you. I think he was just expressing uh, doubt because he, he hadn't actually seen seen the item. And I can understand in an emergency motion that might be the situation. Councillor Winchester. Uh, thank you, uh, Provost. Thank you, uh, Councillor Cassidy. I was just about to say the same. And I have the, the advert in front of me. And for the sake of Councillor Hackett, I will read the first part out. Midlothian Council is recruiting a business manager to manage the business functions for the council leader and group members. There is no lying. There's no spin. That's exactly what it says. And I really object to his to him inferring that it was otherwise. Yes, I think it was just a matter of caution. I, I, I sense we've got quite a lot more business and there is a consensus brewing. Is there anyone opposed to this motion? Councillor Curran. Thanks, Provost. Can I just pick up on Councillor Winchester's remarks? So she said the council. Can I just clarify what she said at the end? It was group members because the emergency motion says Labour group. The council leaders group members are the Labour group. Surely. Doesn't have Labour in the advert though. So that's a matter that needs to be clarified when we remit this to BTSG. Um, the group is clearly not the same thing as all councillors. So perhaps that's a natural inference. Uh, Councillor Johnson. Thank you. I think we have to be awfully careful when we're writing um, job adverts. Imagine going for a job and you think you're going to be a school teacher, but here you get employed as a surveyor. That's more or less what's happening here. We need to be exactly sure because if you turn up on your first day, your brand new job, dead excited, ready to go, and there you are, you haven't got the skill base or anything to do the job. What a disappointment. What a slap in the face. We need to be more careful. Uh, and writing job adverts and going through proper procedures to establish positions. That's my opinion. So I, I agree that we, that we do recall the advert and start again. 
Thank, thank you. Clearly, I have a duty to the public in these matters. Um, second time of asking, uh, unless, is there anyone opposed to this motion? Uh, speak now or forever, hold thy peace. I therefore declare the motion carried. We move, therefore, to the uh, already deposited motions, uh, 7.1. The B-slack replacement school question we've already covered. We have the Lone Head Gala motion. Thank, Thank you, you um, Provost. I'll, I'll be very brief, um, but obviously it's an absolute pleasure um, to bring this motion um, to Council today. The work put in by um, the Lone Head Gala Day Committee, um, especially, and I'll, I'll make um, special mention to Ross Perfect, Alan McLaren, Alan Allard and, and Grant and Anne Stanley, who have done an absolute phenomenal job, not just for um, the Gala Day on the 7th of August, but the full week of events um, that were really uplifting um, for, um, the, for the community and the communities who have had you know, a really tough um, couple of years. So um, I hope that everybody will agree with me um, that, of course, Lonehead Gala Day is always the best um, in Midlothian, but particularly this year as well, the extraordinary effort um, has um, been um, appreciated by us and it'd be good if the leader of the council could also write to um, the Gala Day committee um, and express their um, thanks and appreciation as well. Um, I did just want to add just one final point and that was um, not a point that the Gala Day committee have asked me to raise but I wanted to raise anyway was just around the fact that they had to pay almost a thousand pounds um, for their license to run um, this year's Gala Day um, despite not having um, any of their um, grant released um, since 2018, which I understand was part of an admin error. Um, but however, the Gallaudet did have to pay almost £1,000 this year. I appreciate that that's for a three year licence, um, but I do think that it would be um, a gesture of goodwill um, if we could agree today and ask officers to look at, even at the very least, to refund them um, the equivalent of this year's um, part of their licence, um, I, I think would be good and I would be keen to hear and what others thought about that. Um, but I'll stop there, Provost, and hope that everybody can agree with those points. Thank you, Councillor Parry. And the, the financing of Gala Day is, of course, an important and complex topic and has been running for some time. Can we remit that to, to, to the officers uh, for a detailed reply? Councillor Milligan. Yeah, quite quite happy to read Gala. I think well, Gala Day is one of the, 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 the best in, the, in Scotland, always has been. Uh, and I think the work Gala Day committees and, and other committees do is invaluable. Uh, it would be helpful, I think, for a lower member to be able to get some of the details of what the £1,000 licence fee uh, is for. Uh, and maybe we could get some clarity for officers. I'm just trying to wrap my brain here, but did we not debate actually um, um, exempting or continuing licences um, that hadn't been used over the last couple of years, including for galladies and stuff like that, uh, um, uh, a zero cost? I thought we had already agreed that. I just wonder if officers could maybe give some of the, the details of that. But I wouldn't mind getting, a, I think each group would like to understand how it would cost a thousand pounds for licences, because if, we're, if there's one way to actually start putting uh, and people off running uh, and events like this, it's just to start seeing fees like that coming in for licences just to do them. Yeah, th thank you uh, again, uh, Leader, and that's uh, remitted to the officers. Um, Debbie McCall, the secretary to this motion, and uh, I welcome her to give further comments. Okay. Thank you, Provost. I'm absolutely delighted um, to second um, Councillor Parry's motion. Um, the Lonehead Gala Day has been something um, close to my family's heart for, for quite a few years. Um, my mining great grandfathers um, in Lonehead, and it was always very much um, the, the, the place to go. So, um, very well done to everyone. It's really good to have such a positive um, motion and some good news. Um, to, to bring to the council. Very well done, everybody. And of course, I hope that um, Penny Cook and all the other um, local gala days will be able um, to resume next year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Winchester, then Councillor Hackett. So I just wanted to thank you, Provost. I just wanted to add my congratulations um, with Councillor Parry to Lonehead. I know they've worked exceptionally hard and the fact to cut it down quite a lot but they've done very well. And Councillor Hackett? Yeah, I echo those comments. I've dealt with um, uh, Alan McLaren in his role, not just as Lone Head Gala Day, but as a spokesperson for all the Gala Day committees. And I know how committed he was to pulling off um, a really good event. 
just a second on the council leader's comments as well. It was certainly my understanding that we had um, foregone license uh, costs in particular for gala days. And I know for a lot of groups, money isn't always the number one issue, but again, it's that barrier. Um, and just to go on from that, one of the pieces of work that, if you like, had been impacted by COVID was the actual licensing regime. And I know there's a lot of effort that needs to go on to organising a safe event. There's certainly work that we could be doing, I think, in terms of the licences and public other events and activities and the application processes. And I'll be quite keen to see where the opportunity arises that we get back to looking at that. Thank you. Thank you for that, that contribution. And that was a useful discussion on the Gala, Gala Day tradition of Midlothian generally and the financing questions. We move on now to item 8.1. Uh, Kevin Anderson uh, takes the stage. Uh, we have a contingency planning seminar. Kevin. Thank you, Provost. Um, so this report recommends that Council agree to hold an all member seminar uh, to consider the risks and opportunities in developing the Council's risk strategy uh, and policies in forward planning for contingencies and threats such as climate change, cyber security and future pandemic mitigation. Uh, as the most recent uh, experiences uh, evidence in order that we can develop organisational tolerance and resilience uh, going forward. Thank you. And uh, could I hear it from Councillor Hackett, then Councillor Johnston? Sorry, legacy hand, Provost. Councillor Johnston. Uh, thank you very much, Provost. I agree wholeheartedly that this uh, should be done. And I just wondered if there was some timeline for it. Um, it doesn't say when we would have the seminar because I dare say after the seminar we would have to give the go ahead to get the strategy, etc., all done and then come back to council. So I mean it's not going to be a quick process anyway, so a timeline would be helpful for us. Thank you. Kevin Anderson. Thanks, Provost. Uh, no wanting to preempt Council's decision. Uh, we are looking at uh, potential dates in September, uh, at worst by October, because clearly we'd want to uh, brief on the winter service, which would then be uh, imminent at that point also. So September, October, Councillor Johnson. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Milligan. Yeah, Provost, thanks. Yeah, I warmly welcome uh, um, the seminar. I think it's something that's really important to us. We need to be having a look at when you see some of the issues that have affected um, other countries in, as yet, and indeed sometimes uh, Scotland. When you just take flooding, for example, if you look at the, the, the drastic um, rainfall in Germany and some of the damage in that done there, we all know too well that there are certain areas in Midlothian, for example, that, that, that are prone to flooding. And if you were to get anything like what they were getting in Germany there, we would have serious problems. I think it really, um, Correct. In today's day and age, you may see some of the, 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 the effects that the climate change is having on us, that we really need to make sure that plans are in place for all events that, that, that we can react quite quickly. So I think it's really important that we give a lot of time to this and make sure that we get this right. Thank you for that. Uh, you be aware that our twin partner, Chris Heinsberg in, in the Rhineland, is one of the affected areas, and I'll be writing to the Landrat expressing uh, the best wishes of Midlothian and a dialogue with him I'm in, in months to come I'm sure would be very interesting in that context. Uh, my question for Kevin Anderson is whether this will be integrated with our own risk register uh, and, and not just simply be a, a one-off initiative that goes on the shelf. Certainly, Provost, that's the intention to help inform our risk strategy and any subsequent consequential uh, policies that stem from that. Thank you. Uh, Councillor McKenzie. Thank you, Provost. Probably a similar train of thought from yourself. Um, what would be a practical outcome of this, Kevin? So, for instance, taking climate change, will we, you know, have the discussions and then put it on the shelf, or will we be committing to actions such as cleaning gullies a bit more regularly? I think it could encompass all of that, Councillor McKenzie, and certainly in terms of the um, structure change that we talked about relative to uh, place directorate services. Uh, we see this role sitting within the, uh, the protective services across uh, environmental health, or contingency planning, emergency planning and so on. I mean, we do have a suite of uh, responsive plans. I mean, certainly uh, nobody had one for COVID, uh, I'll concede, but certainly we do across a range of other anticipated events. Uh, but as you say, it would certainly allow us to uh, consider uh, our response, uh, but it has to be in a, a, a real time basis because clearly that was the, the requirement for our most recent response. 
over the past 18 months. It also, just to pick up on your point relative to climate change, will help us in terms of the achievement of the Council's declaration there by 2030. Uh, and I'll just as a, for instance, cite the, um, the housing programme. Clearly, we've adopted passive house through approval at Council. Now, there's a 6% uplift relative to all the housing development costs in relation to that. That wasn't factored into our budget, and I know we'll be talking about the HRA later on this morning. Uh, in terms of schools, if we adopt the same principle, it's a roughly a 13% of uplift that we can look for. And again, at last council, we reported on Destination Hill End, uh, and a major factor in terms of the cost increase there was taking all the sustainability elements uh, and factoring those into the revised budget as well. So clearly, the, uh, there's the unintended consequences potentially uh, that we need to account for, uh, and that's part of what the future planning in the seminar needs to address to my mind. Thanks. Yeah, it's not simply a broad that's had flooding. A painful memory from Midlothian is the washing wave of the A68 just a year ago and the flooding of Faladan. I know we've reacted very strongly to that and there's been a lot of integration with the local voluntary voluntary groups. Thank you for giving us forewarning of that and no doubt the date for the diary will appear. We now move to the Rapid Rehousing Transition Plan, item 8.2 on page 15. Uh, Kevin, I think you've probably got quite a lot of talking to do today. Uh, could you take us through this? Indeed, thank you, Provis. So this paper provides the annual progress report to Middle Orleans Rapid Rehousing Transition Plan that previously been approved by Council in December 2018 in response to the requirements from Scottish Government for each local authority to develop a five-year strategy to end homelessness and rough sleeping. Well, funding for the period 22-23 and future years is yet to be confirmed. We have benefited from grant awards over the year uh, from 2019 through to 21-22, just over 500,000 uh, to achieve the aims um, of the plan, which are detailed in section 3.4 of the report, and also the delivery of actual outcomes in section 3.5. The Council's agreed that an increased number of lets to homeless households is an action. Uh, the Housing First pilot has been initiated, and it bears repeating that the use of B&B was ended for homeless households in November 2020, during the midst of the COVID pandemic. Provost, the annual report was submitted to Scottish Government during the Council recess, and members are recommended to note the paper. Thank you. Uh, thank you uh, very much for the update on that. Uh, Councillor Curran. Thanks, Provost. Uh, the Rapid Rehousing Transition Plan is still a relatively new way of dealing with homelessness, and I'm pleased to note the excellent progress that's been made in its implementation, and specifically the focus to, to prevent homelessness occurring. Throughout the COVID pandemic, the Council's homelessness and housing teams have responded to the challenges of homelessness whilst implementing the Council's rapid rehousing transition plan. And I would like to thank all our staff for their, their hard work. Um, significant progress has been made in transforming services provided to those households experiencing homelessness or threatened with homelessness. Um, specific achievements include, I think it's in the paper as well, ending the use of emergency bed and breakfast accommodation. That was from November 2020 last year. Um, there's been significant reduction in the number of households residing in temporary accommodation over the last two years. We've developed the use of shared temporary accommodation. I know this has been popular with service users. We've also introduced a new housing allocation policy to increase our, our lets to homeless households. And there's also been 51 temporary tenancies that have been changed, or more commonly we would know as flipped into secure tenancies that saves the, the householder uh, moving. Um, and also the Housing First pilot was launched in July 2020, providing 20 new tenancies in year one. And most of, most of us will have seen the works ongoing at Jarnock Court, the refurbishment and converse, conversion works, uh, providing supported accommodation for 22 single households as scheduled for completion by um, February 2020. And Provost, I would like to again thank Simon and all of the team um, for their hard work throughout that period um, and involved in responding to the challenges of homelessness and with the implementation of this plan. I note the report for no time, Provost. Thanks. Thank you. I'd like to concur and congratulate the staff and that department, which is under enormous pressure. They're very responsive, uh, very constructive. Uh, Councillor McCall. Thank you, Provost. Um, I think there's things to celebrate um, in this report, um, including the ending of um, the bed and breakfast. However, there was um, a couple of things that, that, that caught my eye um, on page, I think it's 16 of my pack um, under 
3.4, um, it says that the average time um, for the council to complete its homeless duty will have halved from 105 to 52 weeks. Now, that's welcome. Um, however, 52 weeks is still a year and that's not exactly rapid, um, is it? So I wonder if um, there's any comments um, about that, please. Kevin? Yep, thank you, Councillor McCall. I think that reflects, as we did when the housing strategy came through Council most recently, uh, the limited turnover that we do have within our stock. Uh, now, that clearly benefits us in terms of tenancy sustainability, but it doesn't in terms of the numbers of people who have housing uh, needs and demands that's on our waiting list. And clearly, that's where our housing programme uh, looks to uh, alleviate that. Uh, and certainly in terms of the review of the housing allocation policy to best meet those needs and have larger households downsize, for example, and incentives in relation to that. Uh, so there are different elements within the allocation policy to try and help that turnover, uh, but the reality is clearly we're not going to meet uh, all the demand that there is evident on the waiting list through uh, council housing provision directly uh, in uh, any short period of time which is why you work in partnership clearly with the RSLs in the area and look to other housing models and housing products uh, as well as uh, the direct build uh, for our properties. But certainly that's been uh, as evidenced uh, an, an improvement in that position. Um, and again, it's dependent on some personal choices for uh, uh, housing requirements in areas that we tend to inform those applicants about the realistic prospects uh, of some of those. Um, that people may want to reconsider for their housing prospects. And Councillor Alexander. On mute. Yes, good morning. Um, yes, there, there are many good points to this um, paper. We have done a great deal of work, but also I would like to ask why um, there haven't been steps to provide um, Midlothian Council with uh, prefab houses, houses that, that can be built rapidly. Um, and when we see the need to help people across the world, as well as people in our own um, uh, community, um, it would stop us having to go to um, private landlords and paying you know, huge rents. And also it would pr provide um, really good accommodation, really good short term or long term accommodation for those that we need to rehouse on an emergency basis. Um, and I think that it's something that we should look at and has been uh, put forward by the SNP group before, specifically from um, Colin Cassidy and myself. Um, and I just wonder why this hasn't been taken up. Gavin, would you like to respond? Yes, thanks, um, Councillor Alexander. So certainly in terms of pre-housing, as you term that, uh, doesn't have a good history, clearly, um, uh, and reputation, but I acknowledge and appreciate that certainly things have moved on in that regard. Uh, and indeed, uh, the Council is, through the City Deal work stream for, for housing provision, uh, involved in the demonstrator site, which again is to look at alternative means of delivery, including modular build um, and indeed prefabs, as, as, as you term it, and I know it uh, from a generational perspective as well. Uh, so we're not uh, reluctant. It's looking for the right site for that to actually be uh, provided to, because it is, has been part of our considerations uh, in the delivery uh, ambitions that we've got for Midlothian, um, because certainly uh, it's, it's one of those options that we've looked at uh, and happy to come back to you further offline in terms of the prospect of that. As I say, there is work on going through our city deal collaboration with other partners as well. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, then Councillor Parry, then Councillor McKenzie. Thanks for your promise. Yeah, I'd just like to ask uh, Mr. Anderson. We, uh, I, I'd like to know the criteria for uh, procuring properties for the council because I've come to the council with a few properties that constituents in the likes of uh, John Art Court and Estelle Court have wanted to sell back to the council, and every single time. One minute I'm being told, no, it's three bedrooms we're looking for. Next, I'm being told, no, we don't need three bedrooms, it's two bedrooms. It seems to be a moving feast of whatever I seem to come with from constituents isn't needed. 
And just, just as an example, just last week I spoke to the head of housing about a, there's a property owner has an HMO, which is a beautifully renovated property with sleep 16 people, kitchens, living rooms. And I was told, no, that's not the sort of thing we buy. What are we procuring for this council to alleviate the problems that we have? Because I can't find a, a concise answer. Maybe you can give me one. Kevin? Sure. So the, um, in terms of the, the process, as you've asked, Councillor Cassidy, is we look to open market purchases. Um, so we're, we're not always uh, accepting direct contact in terms of potential sales. We're, we're again, through procurement requirements uh, and transparency, we, we are looking at open market purchases. Uh, so anybody who's interested in selling and to a council, then we will pick it up uh, through the regular review that we do on a weekly basis for suitable properties that are on the market for sale. Uh, now that will vary, as you've clearly experienced in terms of the size and the demand. Um, I uh, Surprised is, is the word in terms of those potentials that you're talking around Eskdale and Jarnock, particularly given the uh, agreement at last council about housing led regeneration. Um, we would certainly want to re explore those options with you. Uh, we can maybe take that offline because uh, clearly that serves our interest with the, uh, the, the plan proposals and ambition uh, for regeneration there too. Uh, but as I say, to answer your question, it's direct open market purchase because that way, as I say, it's transparent relative to procurement uh, and avoids any difficulties or challenge, which we haven't experienced in the past, I can assure you. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Parry. Thank you, Provost. Um, Kevin, I just wanted to ask um, on a kind of a very related topic, you'll be aware that there was um, some figures released by various news outlets at the weekend around how many um, homeless families um, were in homeless accommodation for over three years. I wondered if you could tell us what the figures for Midlothian are and how that compares with other similar sized local authorities with similar housing stock. Kevin, I don't know if you have that at your fingertips, so I would like to dis distribute it to all councillors. <laughs> I have, um, I have some numbers, as you may anticipate, in relation, but I don't have the specifics uh, detail that Councillor Parry is asking for, so we could we can provide that as a post-meeting note. Um, as, as could I ask the for past. the figures that you do have? Um, sure, absolutely. Quite frustrating don't. to not get an answer to questions. Apologies. It's, um, I have 785 open homeless cases uh, and 393 are service users accommodated in temporary accommodation. That, however, is a reduction of 26% over the last five years to our open homeless cases. I know Simon Bain is uh, on the call and he may have the specifics that Councillor Parry is asking for. And if not, then as I say, we can follow, follow up with a post-meeting note. Yeah, the emphasis was over three years, but perhaps you'd like some other data if we have it. Uh, Simon, are you, are, are you there? Yeah, no, I, I can provide in terms of households that have uh, resided in temporary accommodation for over four years. The, the, the information that Councillor Parry is referring to is, um, is information between the years 2007 and the 31st of March 2021. And there's, there's a press release today on, on that very matter. So in terms of Midlothian uh, households who have been residing in temporary accommodation for over three years, we have 13 households. Uh, Councillor Curran re referenced um, the housing allocation policy and specifically the the opportunity to flip temporary accommodation into permanent accommodation and those households, those 13 households have all been contacted um, to, to discuss flipping their, their tenancies. I'm, I'm not in a position to update on, on that today, but can as a post note just update on the progress around that. Yeah, I think all councillors would like a more detailed note uh, addre addressing this issue. Uh, clearly, we're not able to build fresh council houses fast enough to, to address the problems here. Uh, councillor Parry, I think you may want to come back in. Yeah, uh, just obviously um, grateful to get an answer. However, the answer that you've given um, doesn't um, match with the uh, parliamentary um, answer that was um, given to um, MSPs on this question. So I wonder why there's a differential because it's my understanding that there's been 50 families in homeless accommodation um, over three years in the same time frame and dates um, that Simon um, Bain has talked about there. So if there is going to be a fuller reply circulated, it would be useful to know why there's a discrepancy between um, those figures as well. 
Okay, thanks. So gap analysis, if you can, uh, and then Stephen Curran and Colin Cassidy. Thanks, Paul. Then Councillor Parry asked for a, a comparison with other councils with similar stock, but we can't look at that in isolation. We also need to look at demand. And we do have the issue that our stock does not turn over uh, very rap rapidly. People are content, uh, if not very pleased with what we provide in Midlothian. Councillor Cassidy. Provost, Provost, may I interrupt? Stuart, Councillor Stuart McKenzie's been having his hand up for an awfully long time before many other people have spoken. And I don't like my councillors being ignored. Can you please address um, his inquiry, please? Uh, thank you, Councillor Johnson. May I blame the technology that I generally read from the top names down because that's the way in which it, it appears. But uh, for some reason, Stuart has been left at the bottom. So. In answer to that plea, um, Councillor McKenzie, uh, I apologise there was no intention uh, to hold you back. Oh, none, 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 none taken, Provost. Uh, we all have the vagaries of technology to deal with. Um, there's a question for Kevin. Um, it's on 3.5, we made reference to the housing first pilot uh, launched July 2020. I'm wondering, was that a pilot that was going to report after month 12? Um, if so, when will it be reporting? Um, or is it a longer term pilot that's maybe going to be sort of 24, 36 months? And if we are going to report on it, what's your initial feelings on the pilot? Is that something we're going to follow up quite robustly on? Yeah, Councillor McKenzie, I'll defer to Simon Bain for the detail as he's closer to the implementation of that project, but certainly we seem to have positive results just in terms of the, the, the gist of your, your question. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure if you're maybe also referring to the the um, tenancy the tenancy grant paper we were going to review after 12 months and bring that back to to council. We had that uh, report in contrast to housing first, but I'll let Simon speak to housing first because he has that detail. Thank you. Yeah. There are two yeah. papers in play here. Simon. Hi, Councillor McKenzie. The the um, indeed. Housing First pro, pro, pro program um, has there's been an internal review with uh, with the key stakeholders, uh, and we, we've reported on that. And there's some reference in the rapid rehousing transition plan to, to that. Um, it's been very successful in in enabling the most um, vulnerable in some respects and some more very chaotic um, housing applicants to achieve secure housing outcome. Um, much quicker than they ordinarily would would have, and to, to date the um, the tenancy sustainment rates are, are, have been very good. It's been very good feedback from 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 the tenants themselves. Albeit, you know, there have been some uh, instances where there have been some challenging situations where we're having to deal with um, with na neighbour relations, and I, I've spoken with a number of councillors on on that matter. But overall, been very positive. Um, that's the the internal review. Um, that, that are referred to is something that we can share with councillors. Um, it's nothing at all that um, we want to, to, to hide there and to say some really positive outcomes that are identified as part of that report. Um, I, th I think the, the second point that Kevin mentioned is I think there's the 12 month review is on the, the homeless prevention fund, which is also referenced in the, the rapid re housing transition plan, which just recently came into effect, so we'll, we'll be looking to to report back on that um, 12 months uh, this time, about this time next year, uh, and also as part of our annual update to the Scottish Government on the rapid rehousing transition plan. So the shopping list there is the uh, data analysis that was raised earlier, and there's also this internal review, which I think you're happy to release. Is there anything else you in, you can send us in the same bundle, or do we need to wait for the the other items you mentioned? This is a question for Simon. I uh, can't think of it, but that, that we'll provide that information um, after today's meeting. Yeah, much appreciated. Uh, can I have uh, Councillor Cassidy, then Councillor Hackett? Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I was just going to get back to uh, Mr Anderson and his point about the um, procurement of the ex-council properties. Um, the three of the tenants I'm talking about are elderly people who did not want to put their properties on the market. They didn't want to, they, they thought they'd have people traipsing through their houses. And each one of them emphasised that they would take a fair valuation 
on the property. Are, are we being told that we're not allowed to buy anything without it going on the open market? Is it, I, I mean, I just want to know for, for future reference. Thank you, Councillor Cassidy. That's a very good question. How rigid are the procurement rules? Uh, Kevin Anderson. Thank you. Professor. So that's, that certainly has been our practice, Councillor Cassidy. That's to safeguard um, both officers and potential uh, sellers, uh, to be uh, frank about it, in the open market. But I appreciate uh, the uh, situation has changed, particularly in terms of the, the location you're referencing, uh, given the Council's intended plans and uh, aims for regeneration in that locality. But certainly when we've considered a town centre regeneration before, uh, we look to uh, engage with people directly. So that's why I say earlier we should probably revisit this with you offline uh, in terms of particular uh, individual properties uh, and see what we can do in that respect. OK, and I think if, if you could share that reconsideration with all the councillors, because obviously following the public plant is a very sensitive matter, but we perhaps have to be flexible in the in the, the current situation if we're to achieve our housing, our housing aims. Councillor Hackett. Thanks, Provost. Um, when we're talking about homelessness, you know, we're in the paper we um, talk about quite rightly uh, reducing or removing the use of bed and breakfast. What type of accommodation are people staying in um, when we talk about temporary accommodation? Because um, that's obviously quite a long period of time for people to be in, but I know uh, Mr. Bain was talking about people being offered the accommodation that they're in. So is it possible just to get an understanding of the nature of temporary accommodation that our uh, homeless uh, residents are in? Thank you. Uh, question for Simon Bain, I think. Simon. Yeah, Councillor Hackett, again, the, the Rapid Rehousing Transition Plan uh, touches on this and it's um, in the past 12 months, the Council have developed or the, the Housing and Homelessness Service have developed um, shared accommodation. Um, so it's essentially using two bedroom council accommodation where two individuals share accommodation. So we currently have 54 um, shared tenancies. So that, that, that's, that's been a significant development over the past 12 months. Um, and, and again, we've had some really good positive feedback from those that have moved into the shared accommodation. And I, I accept and I understand that it's not the culture of um, to share in, in Midlothian, but and that was one of our um, that some of, one of the risks that we had that we that we discussed at the, the beginning of the project. So that that's been really successful. Um, a, a lot of um, single. Um, person households are, are are continuing to stay in our shared supported accommodation, um, it's where, whereby we contract with a an external organisation who manage the, the the buildings and provide um, on site support to to, to individuals, uh, and also uh, provision of housing options advice uh, and referring on to, to to any other agencies that are that are that are identified as, as being appropriate through the the, the support um, planning with, with with individuals. Uh, and we also have a, a, a stock of our own accommodation that we provide as temporary accommodation. So we're currently using 410 properties as temporary accommodation, and that includes a small number of um, housing association leases. And and, uh, and th those um, was the focus of the the, the rapid rehousing transition plan. Um, again, is to is to reduce our use of, of temporary accommodation and increase or reduce the the uh, amount of time it takes the council to uh, to provide a, a permanent uh, housing solution uh, a council or, or or housing association permanent tenancy does, does that cover your point councillor hackett the, the, yeah, i thanks. should should also add councillor hackett that what one of the, the the benefits of um of the shared um model is that the uh the, the rent for those are more affordable than than our, than our current uh, temporary accommodation mainstream properties, and that, that's something that we're going to address early next year uh, through the, the 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 rent strategy. Thank you, and Councillor Cassidy. Thank you. Uh, just a, a question to Simon again here. The um, uh, on a, a, a constituency level, I have a constituent in Woodburn who continually uh, contacts me because we have a temporary uh, housing solution up there in a, one of the streets. And it's a th beautiful three bedroom house that we renovated 
uh, after a family had left and they put two young lads in this house and they're running amok and I've reported it to the police, I've reported it to housing uh, about this and I never get anything. They, everything seems to be OK, but what do we do to police these areas where we have a uh, unruly uh, temporary accommodation residents? Is there anything we can do with these people? Yeah, well, Councillor yep. Cassidy is, is one that you know very happy to, to to pick up after today's meeting. We could have a a, a talk through the, the process, but as part of the rapid rehousing transition plan, we we the council have used some of the Scottish government monies to to fund a full time post to manage the shared accommodation. Um, so yeah, it's re relatively small uh, number of properties that the that the, the member of staff manages compared to our. Our, our housing officers who are managing a much bigger patch. So the, the idea is that, that they will, you know, very quickly and robustly uh, manage those those tenancies. And that would include, you know, visiting properties on a regular basis to ensure that that, that individuals are, are using the property as the principal home, that they're that they're that they're respecting the house, uh, and that they, they're dealing with any um, councillor or or community concerns about the, the, the conduct of those um, individuals. So there's a, an occupancy agreement that, is, that the individuals sign up to, which is very similar to a secure tenancy agreement. And the members of staff are, you know, are tasked to and uh, responsible for managing those. So I, I suggest it's, it's one perhaps we, we could pick up separately and just have a ch chat through and see what we can yeah, do. Yeah, I'd to, like to have a chat about that because the, this person's having trouble at three o'clock in the morning. And I don't think our inspectors work at three o'clock in the morning and uh, there's a disturbance to the whole neighbourhood with this one particular property. I think we need to be on top of this uh, because we we just can't be dropping people into residential areas with women, children, families that are trying to live a life and then it's turned into party land. Yeah, I mean, obviously this is an issue that virtually all councillors have in, in their inbox and it, uh, we used to have community teams which helped in this area. I'm glad to hear, Simon, that you have a, a member of staff uh, in, involved here. There's also the side issue of drugs. So again, I, I hate to add to your workload, Simon, but this is probably an issue that it should be shared with all the councillors if, if there's something we can say on it. Um, councillor Curran. Uh, I'm not sure if Mr Stuart McKenzie, Councillor McKenzie had his hand up before me. I wouldn't like to upset Councillor Johnson, I'm not sure. Oh, thanks, Councillor McKenzie. Um, I feel sometimes, Provost, that temporary accommodation tenants get uh, unjustifiably uh, a stigma attached to them. Um, Councillor Cassidy referred to the tenants, um, and although that's shared accommodation, as uh, unruly. Just remind all councillors, we do have unruly tenants and our permanent tenancies as well. I just sometimes feel like that there's a stigma attached to temporary accommodation that's unjustified. Yeah, I, I imagine a tiny number spotted for, for, for the rest. Uh, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, you're still, for some reason, sitting at the bottom of my list, but this is your chance. Thank you, Provost. Uh, I just wanted to pick up a point that um, Councillor Cassidy and Simon were discussing with regards to our tenants who are perhaps unruly at night when the usual our council staff will not be working, and the example was at three o'clock in the morning. Simon, do you receive any support from the community action team or from Police Scotland? Do you feel that level of support is correct? Do you need more or less? Yeah, hi, Councillor McKenzie. Well, we 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 um we caught up on Friday and we had a, a, a similar chat um around these sorts of issues. So yeah, we work very closely with our our community um safety partners and other uh, services within the council to ensure that there's a joined up approach to these um these issues. Um, sure, there there will be issues um where there's uh, antisocial behaviour that's uh, that's being caused at three o'clock in the morning. So that certainly that would be. Um, not knowing the, the details of the, the actual incident, but be very appropriate to contact police co colleagues uh, who, who could address uh, and attend at, at that time. Um, we got very close links with police uh, in, in that where antisocial behaviour is, uh, is, is conducted from within one of our properties. We receive uh, a report from the police that allows our housing officers to to investigate and then to take the appropriate and proportionate tenancy action. Thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Parry, I think, is indicating there's information within the motion. Councillor Parry. Oh, no, sorry, I think that comment was there um, from before. Probably, I've just got a question for Simon, actually. 
um, although perhaps we could have a whip round first and get Simon 50p for the metre, um, could you simply be in the dark there. Um, Simon, I just wanted to ask a point of clarity on um, what you just raised there around the process um, for tenants to get in touch with the resident social behaviour. Um, I've previously always advised tenants, of course, to get in touch with yourselves and get in touch with police. Um, and what tenants tell me is that they are normally asked for evidence by um, housing teams, and I understand that. Um, that evidence is normally in the form of um, incident numbers from police. Um, however, I know the police are also under pressure, and um, certainly when constituents phone 101, if they can get through, um, are told that they can't get an incident number um, anymore um, for those types of calls, particularly where the police can't attend. So I wonder if that's something that you could um, clarify um, perhaps the next time you meet police colleagues as to what is the best route for tenants to build up the type of evidence um, that the housing teams um, need in a way um, that doesn't um, put an extra burden on police resources or uh, the one on one call centres. Yeah, practical questions. It's a, it's a, a good point, Councillor Parry. Um, the, um, it's, it's not simply just uh, that the staff rely on, on police evidence. The um, members of staff will also contact local residents uh, to seek to corroborate the feedback that we receive uh, from tenants or from other sources that are feeding that information into the team. There's other um, things that the, the team uh, currently do as well in terms of sound equipment to get to gather in evidence uh, and you know, in cer certain circumstances where there was some significant risks raised, um, the use of CCTV and covert CCTV. So it's, it's not simply just, just relying on police evidence, but the, the threshold um, in, in terms of evidence when the council take a, a case to court is, is very high. Um, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's why the staff team uh, impress uh, upon uh, those that are contacting in, re in relation to antisocial behaviour and there's a, and that's a lot of contact on a daily basis um, re requesting um, that information. OK, I'd like to call Councillor Johnson, then Councillor Cassidy, and then uh, we've got a very good discussion today. Uh, uh, Kevin Anderson, perhaps to, to close off this, this session with quite a lot to follow from Simon Bain. Thank, thank you in advance. Councillor Johnson. Thank you very much. I'll always be the first person to defend and rush to the help of a homeless person or family, usually in all circumstances. However, in my experience, I do know we have unruly tenants, whether they're temporary tenants, homeless tenants or permanent tenants. And what we need to do is have a better understanding of what exactly is expected of a tenant. It doesn't say anything about community wellbeing in a tenancy agreement, but is that something the housing officers discuss with um, tenants of any kind when they're giving them their new tenancy? I think that's quite important. And the other thing um, that Simon's just referred to, sometimes if you live next door to an unruly person, they're usually got other issues. And it may well be that the rest of the neighbours are frightened um, or they perceive mm. that there's a risk to them to job them into the cops or the housing officer. So I, I don't think it's really um, always easy for housing officers and other upset tenants to report that information and gather the information. There must be better ways of uh, providing and promoting community wellbeing. Thank you. Yeah, perhaps Simon could comment on that. Simon, you mentioned that there's a document that sets out their wider responsibilities in terms of neighbourliness. Uh, is it perhaps a missed opportunity to actually physically talk people through this that because of COVID we've just sent out something out digitally and, and it's completely ignored? How does it work? No, not, not at all. The, the, um, so there's, the, I think Councillor Johnson has, has, um, has raised a, a kind of wider issue, but just in respect of the information provision to new tenants, um, the housing officers meet with the new tenant um, at the sign up stage, um, talk through the, the tenancy agreement. There's a section in the tenancy agreement, section three. Um, I can provide a copy of the tenancy agreement again in terms of the information pack if, if that's, um, if, if that's uh, something that councillors would find useful. Um, and, and that sets out quite clearly uh, tenants' um, responsibility in respect of. The respect for their neighbours and, and how they, they should or it's expected that they conduct a tenancy. Um, th there's a, that's then re-emphasised at a follow-up um, settling in visit uh, that takes place within six weeks of the new tenancy starting. Um, and the council team are currently reviewing 
other information that, that we provide to tenants. Um, so that we have a tenant's handbook and there's a section in the tenant's handbook that, that, that touches on um, behaviour, uh, antisocial behaviour. So that's currently being reviewed with a group of tenants. Uh, we'll be looking to, uh, to issue that electronically sometime early next year, I would anticipate. Uh, that's one of the, uh, the actions that was on the tenant participation strategy that councillors signed off um, a, a, a recent uh, council meeting. So you know, lot, there's lots of information uh, and advice that's, that's provided. Um, we're trying to prevent um, neighbours falling out or being antisocial as much as we can, but you know, there's um, you know, realistic enough and, 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 and being involved in uh, this um, area of work for long enough to, to, to realise that there's, there's only so much that we could be doing uh, to, uh, to moderate people's behaviours. Thank you on that. Uh, Councillor Cassidy, then, then Kevin Anderson. Yeah, thank you again, Chair. Uh, just, to, just to reply uh, quickly to Councillor Kern, I do realise there are unruly full-time residents in properties that I get quite a lot of complaints because we no longer have a community team to go around and check these people that we used to have in Midlothian. Uh, but the one thing I was pointing out there was there's two young men in a three-bedroom house that would do a family of five or six even, and you put two young guys together in a house, you've got a recipe for disaster. I know because I used to be a young guy, so I just wanted to clear that up. Yep, uh, indeed so. And uh, Councillor, Councillor Hackett has appeared. Again, I'd like the officer to close proceedings. Uh, Councillor Hackett. Just in the entrance of balance, I was also a young guy and I wasn't a terror. So, you know, they're not all bad. Thanks, Provost. Uh, I don't think we allow virtue signalling on such a topic, but uh, there we go. Uh, Kevin Anderson. Anderson. Provost, thank you. Um, certainly in terms of the, the theme there, we're able to uh, task the community action teams, the funded police teams that the Council has in terms of interventions and enforcement. Uh, and also it's uh, not particular to any type of tenure where we encounter antisocial behaviour. Uh, and always appreciate there's engagement and active interest from members when we bring any form of housing paper to the council agenda. Uh, and it's maybe suggest whether there was a, a need or a requirement to benefit from a housing seminar promised, uh, just to try and uh, close this as appreciate there is other business today. So uh, with all the material coming from Simon, uh, you think that should be followed up by a housing seminar? We've, we've done that before, of course, it's always very informative. Well, I think exactly there is that active interest genuinely there, and I think it's probably helpful for us to talk through those elements of the service that interest members as to what we actually do, because that's evident from some of the questions that um, it's, it's not uh, clear or transparent in terms of the, the service operations. OK, and we have the le leader would like to, I think, finalise this discussion. Councillor Milligan. Yeah, probably. So the one thing that's really clear is when you look at the, the, the waiting list in Midlothian, that uh, uh, irrespective of how, how quickly we bald hooses and how quickly we, we get hooses, we're always going to be struggling to try and, uh, and keep up with demand. I actually agree with Colin I, I'm on, on a lot of the issues here. Something when you put two young ladies into an accommodation, two, put two or three of them, it, it can be a recipe for disaster. In some cases it works, not in quite a lot of cases it works, but in some cases it, it, it simply doesn't work. And it's looking for the assurances that when it's no work and that the officers need to be taken uh, um, the time to try and resolve that and make sure that people stay next to them are not left uh, 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 um, suffering because of it. One of the things that has risen though, is some years ago, Kevin, you can remember when I met the Housing Minister, one of the areas that I pushed, uh, I think it was Kevin Stewart at the time, was um, we were looking to, to, to build um, single person accommodation. Now at that time, um, the grant that comes along for housing uh, and to local authorities, um, which is about £57,000 a house, was not um, eligible to apply and didn't apply to single person accommodation. We were wanting to build, like say, studio flat type accommodations for single people. Uh, has that changed any at all, or is there any merit in going back to the government and asking uh, um, for that again? Because I, I, I genuinely believe what Colin's saying here. When you have uh, um, groups areas where you're sticking two and three young people together, then 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 you can have a, a, a proper recipe for disaster. I wonder, Kevin, if you'd like to respond on that high-level question. Of course, our stock is highly biased towards two beds. 
Yep, indeed. Thank you, Provost. So, um, Councillor Milligan's correct. We were not attracting subsidy in terms of studio type properties as, as starter homes, as, as you may term them, as, as people move through uh, the, the requirements and they, and they develop and change. Um, so the subsidy element, as I say, was declined. We appealed to the minister himself. Uh, that was also declined. I appreciate there's been changes in, in that respect. There's also been a review in terms of the benchmarking levels, and indeed that's on the COSLA agenda uh, for this Friday for leaders too. Uh, but the distinction between uh, what's attracted for the registered social landlords, the housing associations, and the local authorities um, has not appeared to have shifted in that review of benchmarking. But it might be an opportunity to, to revisit that particular point, uh, given there's ministerial change as well. Uh, and we know again the ambition of the National Affordable Housing Supply Programme may be something that we can revisit uh, with our civil servant counterparts as a starting point. Thank you all for that, uh, Simon. We look forward to the further data and papers and Kevin to organising a housing seminar where we can pick up on some of these very important themes. We now move to item 8.4, uh, the Afghan locally employed staff relocation scheme, uh, which I as a Army uh, champion here, I have a particular interest in this. Uh, Excuse me, Provost, to... you've, Provost, you've forgotten 8.3, which is the care service. I do apologise. Thank you. 8.3, uh, before we get on to Afghanistan, uh, a national care service for Scotland. Uh, I think Fiona Robertson is in fact going to speak to this. Fiona. Yes, good afternoon, Provost and elected members. Um, so the council is being requested to approve our request to deliver a seminar in September to discuss the content of the National Care Service Review, given how extensive it is, and in order to help inform the council's response to the consultation and to bring the council's response back to the October council for approval prior to submission. Members will be aware that an independent rev review of adult social care was published earlier this year and the report set out a number of areas of focus to enable a step change in outcomes for people in receipt of care. And that's set out in section three of this report. So the consultation opened on the 9th of August and it will last for a period of 10 weeks, closing on the 18th of October. And it sets out proposals for an expanded scope beyond the adult social care to include children and young people, community justice, alcohol and drug services and social work. So the seminar shall offer an overview of all of the areas being considered within the consultation and implications for governance, finance and risk. And the seminar will also offer an opportunity to consider the Council's response to the 96 questions that are embedded within the consultation document uh, within the respondent information documentation and happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. So this will return uh, in an expanded form uh, without, with output to the October uh, Council meeting. Are there any questions on this? There being none, uh, we, we move to Kevin Anderson and item 8.4 on page 27. Thank you, Provost. Um, this report is for members' consideration in the Council's participation in the UK Government uh, Relocation Scheme for Afghan locally employed staff who have worked with British forces and as a consequence uh, there are fears for their safety as the British and NATO troops depart from the country. There are no numbers specified. Uh, the request is in terms of what councils can accommodate individually. Members will appreciate that this paper was dated over two weeks ago and the situation has deteriorated and remains very fluid on a daily basis since. The background detailed in the report is specific to the category of Afghans and their families who largely worked as interpreters, but in recent days, an additional scheme has been announced by the UK government for humanitarian assistance uh, and refugees who have also provided other assistance to the forces or their partners or to non-governmental organisations prior to the current withdrawal. While we do await details of this scheme, it is notionally similar in outline to the Syrian Vulnerable Persons Resettlement Scheme that we do have experience of. So the resources to support arrivals in the respect of local authorities has increased over that which is detailed in this paper. So consequently mitigates the risk element that's noted in the recommendation at point three. 
To assist members' considerations, I advise that in the Syrian VPR scheme, 40,000 nationals were accepted into the UK, and that equated to around 40 individuals ultimately resettled into Midlothian. The announcement over the past weekend of 20,000 Afghan refugees would notionally equate to around 20 individuals potentially for Midlothian. Provost, if members are minded to participate in the Afghan locally employed self staff sorry, relocation, may I also ask now for governance uh, in any recommendation for the scheme which is currently being developed for Afghan refugees to allow officers to engage and carry out the necessary planning. Thank you. Uh, there's a mention of 10,500 ahead here. I hate to put in a price on this, but is this going to be anywhere near adequate uh, in, in terms of our own finances to support ad, uh, proportion, uh, proportionately? So the, that was a concern probably, and that's why we raised the financial risk potential. Uh, that was also limited to a four month period for the locally employed Afghans who would relocate. Uh, that situation has changed over the past week. Uh, indeed, we've had supplementary uh, advice com coming in yesterday, in fact, uh, from the uh, uh, local government um, minister at uh, UK level, indicating there are additional resources. And indeed, the four month period uh, has been extended uh, as well to 12 months. Uh, and in, as I say, the other scheme, which is still being developed, is likely to equate to the Syrian scheme. So there's an enhanced value and an enhanced period that would relate to that, but we've yet to get that confirmed. Thank you. Councillor Parry, then Councillor Curran, then Councillor Alexander. Thanks, Provost, um, and thanks, Kevin. I'm so glad to see this paper on the agenda today. You'll know that um, <clears throat> I have been writing to you um, over the last few weeks um, to, um, to try and see what we could do, because there's nobody um, that can he be moved by the scenes that we've seen um, coming from Afghanistan um, and, you know, as a human being, um, but particularly as a mum, um, you know, watching women, um, you know, try and uh, get their babies over walls um, has been absolutely harrowing. Um, and I read over the weekend about a woman who um, gave birth uh, in the cargo of um, a rescue plane as well. And I just think that is, uh, you know, the most horrible situation in the world for any human being to be in, but as a parent, um, I, I just can't imagine what that might be like. Um, and I think the plight of women and girls um, across, Af across Afghanistan um, hasn't went um, unnoticed as well. And, and I certainly um, pray for everybody there and I hope that they can make um, safe passage um, here. Um, in terms of the paper, I do think that we could do more in terms of um, the locally um, employed offer um, that we've got in the paper. Um, I hope that people are like minded and that um, we could agree as councillors um, to increase our offering. Um, but I'm also glad that we're given um, future governance in terms of um, what might come out of the um, Afghan um, refugee scheme. Um, you know, since 2015, Scotland has taken more um, than its um, UK equivalent share um, of Syrian refugees. Um, and every single local authority in Scotland has participated um, in that Syrian scheme. And those people are they're new Scots. Um, they're here, they're settled, they participate in our communities, they're business people, um, you know, they're, they're absolutely um, one of us. So um, I think that in terms of the refugee scheme, um, 20 based on um, Kevin's numbers, um, I, I think um, is minimal. And actually, I think one of the things that we should do in picking up um, Provost Point is I actually think that we should, um, on the back of whatever agreement we make today, that we should write to the Home Office um, and ask that um, both the schemes um, are properly funded because I think that there's a recognition that the funding um, isn't enough and that we want to do more um, and that we should write to the Home Office um, to do that. Um, and I also think um, if people are like minded that we should also include um, in that um, a line about scrapping the borders bill because I think that that is incredibly um, harmful in terms of its um, rhetoric and our commitment um, that we want to make to settling refugees um, here in Midlothian. So I hope that we could increase the numbers um, of both the schemes, but obviously I'm interested to hear what others have to say. Thank you for that. Councillor Curran. Thanks, Provost, and I agree with much what Councillor Parry um, has mentioned. Again, I, I welcome the commitment to resettle the, the Afghan citizens. As Councillor Parry uh, referred to, we played a key role in the success of the Vulnerable Syrian Resettlement Scheme, resettling 3,000 people across our communities. And I'm proud that Scotland and Midlothian is ready to take up that role again. And I, I know the First Minister has called on the Prime Minister to go further and faster 
and I couldn't agree with those comments more. Um, but this is not the fault of the Afghan, Afghan citizens, and you know, as Councillor Parry referred to, we've seen the the broadcast on the news, and in all honesty, based on the news reports that I've seen, at least uh, they look to have been abandoned through no fault of their own. And Provis, we're seeing families just not in search of a better life, but just in search of the basic opportunities that exist for us that we take for granted every day, and particularly for for women and girls. Um, I would like to say that uh, it's also good to hear that Melville House and Association are also going to be supporting the resettlement scheme um, and hopefully other RSAs can take that up as well. Uh, Provost, I'm happy to second the, the um, amendments if that's what Councillor Parry proposing in terms of the, the funding and our um, increased participation and also um, in terms of Kevin Anderson's uh, government governance uh, requirements. Um, I know there's going to be challenges ahead for us, but uh, as the paper hi highlighted, I'm sure that we can agree that we will do everything we can to support the resettlement. Thanks, Provost. Thank you for that. This is indeed a report for a decision. I wonder if Democratic Services have uh, clarity on the wording of, of the amendments that have just been referred to. I've got a note of the, the additional um, um, comments made by a Councillor Parry, which I'll include in the minute. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, Councillor Alexander, then Councillor Hackett. Yes, I would just like to support what Councillor Parry and Councillor uh, Curran have said. I personally have been um, involved in kind of rescuing a person that was on death row, um, ready to be beheaded in Iran, and that was such a horrible, horrible pos um, position to be in. Um, they were saved. And um, also just reiterating what uh, Councillor Parry said, seeing the views on television, there was one little boy in particular who looked exactly like my little grandson. And that just moved me. It, it really brought home, this is people like us, and we've got to do everything that we can to, to, to help them. And when they come here, they, they are going to contribute to our country. They're going to be people that that are going to to help us, um, you, you know, make Scotland a better country. And so, and I I would say again, why are we not building? I, I hear what um, Kevin Anderson said about uh, where. But we need to build lots more houses, affordable houses, houses that we can build quickly um, to help these people, to help our own people and to help people across the world. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Councillor Hackett, then Councillor, uh, uh, Councillor Hackett. Thank you, Provost. Um, with respect to the uh, locally employed personnel scheme, um, would the military covenant apply in this position, given that they were working for the British military, or is that only open to um, service personnel? I don't know if you know, uh, Provost, or if uh, Mr. Anderson could answer. Thank you. Kevin Anderson. Provost, yes. In terms of the practicalities of um, accommodating any uh, arrivals uh, through the Syrian scheme, we dealt with that through our homelessness um, allocation policy and, and anticipate similarly uh, the same will apply here in terms of the relief to remain that's likely to be granted if not uh, uh, residency ultimately as well. Uh, there will be other practicalities relative to benefit entitlement, indeed the benefit cap um, with the universal credit, uh, those things were not quite embedded uh, with our last uh, experience through the Syrian scheme. So those are the those are the practicalities, as I say, that I seek your consent and we can go off and, and work through what needs to happen in that regard. Thank you. And okay. Councillor Johnston. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, I, I wholeheartedly agree that we should do absolutely everything and probably more uh, to help all these people. But when I'm reading a uh, 6.3 risk uh, in the, in the um, papers, and it's talking about the perceived impact on waiting list applicants, uh, making assumptions that the housing allocation list and how are we going to manage that to assure our own people who are in desperate need 
of housing as well, that they're not forgotten, that we're, we're on the ball, we're getting things organised and we will get to them eventually. But as well as that, I was thinking that it could also be mean a waiting list for things like schools and GPs, opticians, etc. So how are we going to manage that per perceived attitude out in the, our communities? Yeah, thank you. In the context of perhaps expecting 20 or maybe a little bit more, but we just don't know. Uh, Kevin Anderson. Um, certainly it's not an unknown experience, as Councillor Johnson outlines there, and, and we did have that experience with the previous uh, Syrian arrivals, but uh, certainly the position is that, uh, that there are no additional entitlements. Uh, people will be eligible for exactly the same uh, as any other UK citizen. That's certainly the status they will have, uh, whichever, as I say, whether it's resettlement or whether it's uh, leave to remain. Uh, so as a UK citizen, whether that's permanent or temporarily, they're entitled to exactly the same as you and I uh, and any other citizen of the UK uh, or Scotland in that regard too. Uh, so there's nothing extra, there's nothing more than uh, happening there. It's about what people's uh, eligibility and entitlement is. Certainly, again, what's changed for us since um, our last experience here is the increased provision uh, awarded to homelessness in the allocation policy. So again, it takes account of those who present to us in homeless circumstances. Uh, so there, to pick up your point, that others feeling uh, they've been uh, lost out, uh, that is not the reality relative to housing services. I appreciate there's other impacts for education and indeed health. Uh, and that's where, again, we would convene our Care for People group, as we did previously, so those other interests uh, are taken into account. Uh, so that, again, people can access those services without unduly impacting on the current permanent residents of Midlothian. Uh, so again, that's the, the practicalities that we need to take away and work through uh, with our counterpart public services. Thank, thank you for that. Um, it's not the time to discuss the whole issue of Afghanistan over 100 years, except there's a special resonance for us in Midlothian because the greatest of William Gladstone's speeches was made here in Dalkeith where famously he said the, the sanctity of the lives of the hill villagers of Afghanistan is the same as the sanctity of lives here. And I think if we can, in practical terms, uh, respond after all the decades to, to that, that statement in, in a fundamentally humanitarian way, that that will be on the escutcheon of Midlothian Council uh, for many years to come. So thank you for your contributions. Financial monitoring, 8.5. Uh, Kevin, I think you're speaking to this. Thank you, Provost. Yes, so um, Mr Fairley is not available and uh, other senior finance officer is also uh, not available at this time. So I'm happy to introduce the papers, the financial papers, and I'm going to be ably assisted by our uh, finance team who have also joined the, the meeting for any specific questions from members. Thank you. So Provost, this purpose of this report is to provide Council with information on the projections of performance against the service revenue budgets over 21-22 and gives details of the material variances against those. Uh, the performance figures shown in Appendix 1 result in a projected net underspend of uh, 0.323 million for the year, which is 0.13 of the revised budget. Members will be aware that Council in June, uh, they'd instructed a review of the deliverability of the savings targets for the current year. Uh, as a consequence of the effects of the pandemic uh, and budget uh, pressures equally as a consequence and that's reflected in this the next monitoring report. The outcome of that work again from the endeavours of our uh, finance team has involved the removal of some of those savings targets and mitigation against uh, underspends. The general fund balance is reflected in the revised service budgets accordingly detailed again in appendix one. The projection of the general fund balance for the year end at 31st March 22 is however predicated on the financial impact of COVID-19 continuing to be met from the available funding and uh, for specific purposes and the general funding which is provided. Also additional costs that are in incurred sorry, and projected through lost income due to COVID. There's more detail in that respect at Appendix 2. The projected overspends, however, are those referenced in terms of the Council's operating fleet and their mitigating uh, actions being taken by the Chief Officer of Place in relation to moratorium on that spend. There's been the review of the annual insurance premiums, of which we, we don't have any direct control, that's general market pressures. 
and also the uh, delivery of the medium term financial strategy is in progress. And again, the chief officer, please can speak to that. Has there been progress in recent weeks about the implementation? So those are delayed as opposed to being deferred. Um, and the positive aspects of the medium term financial review are the range of vacancies. And again, we're working through that with the structure changes and the projections at the time again of this report being drafted for the numbers across the learning settings uh, for children, which will be subject to change on the resumption of uh, the new term now. In section 3.4, there's reference to the COVID funding that's provided by Council uh, and the recoveries across the year 20 to 21 and indeed continuing into 21-22. Another note is in relation to the provision for pay awards, and that's taken account of the uh, subsequently revised pay policy um, for uh, the budget purposes. There's reference also clearly to the IGB in terms of the allocation of uh, 47 million point seven two four, and there's the increase to 47 million seven hundred thirty nine uh, to reflect the pay awards as referenced there. Position at section five on the projected general fund reserve uh, indicates that the 4.142 million is above the minimum set in the council's reserve strategy, uh, but will only remain that way if there's no further adverse performance against the budget or a draw on reserves. And similar looking ahead in terms of the forward planning we've referenced earlier in the meeting to the winter service. Work continues across the finance team to reduce those overspends again with counterparts in the specific services where that pressure is experienced uh, and also to deliver on the pace of the savings. Relative to areas of risk, promise the, uh, at the, this early point in the financial year, there is a risk of variation from actual costs and the income across the remainder of the financial year. And again, the prospect potentially of any local or national restrictions being reintroduced uh, relative to the pandemic. Um, so the financial projections are predicated on the new burdens, also those arising from the Scottish Government's 100 day commitments, a number of those yet to be fully funded uh, and fully explored, and also in terms of the child abuse inquiry and the potential for claims, uh, and separately work still to be done in terms of the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child as and when that is incorporated uh, into Scottish legislation. And I'm happy to pause there, Provost, for any questions to my accountant colleagues. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you, Kevin. Uh, one thing I completely anticipated by me was this 406,000 adverse variants on our, our fleet at, you know, at a time when the traffic on the roads was well down and we weren't performing all the functions we used to. Uh, how has that come about and why didn't we know it was, it was going to happen? Uh, certainly that's in terms, well, I see Mr Oliver's joined us. I'll take some respite. Thank you, Claude. Right. Um, in terms of the, the, the fleet aspect, we have had a, an increasing fleet um, over a, a number of years um, and at the same time a, a dwindling workforce in terms of mechanics. Now, mechanics uh, present itself with a, a tricky situation in that it doesn't seem to be a career of choice for many uh, at this particular moment in time. And what we have is an ageing demographic of uh, mechanics uh, and at the same time being presented with um, people who have been off uh, through the pandemic uh, in terms of uh, isolation, in terms of being contacts and uh, we also have leave to be able to, to provide. And at the same time, those who do choose uh, mechanics as a career of choice are incentivised to, to go to the private sector, um, given the benefits and salary that they are being uh, attracted with. However, I must caveat that with there is a dearth of mechanics out there um, and even the private sector is significantly struggling with the capacity. So with the, the workforce issues that we've had, we have had to have an increased fleet over the public health challenges of distancing within vehicles as well, the additional uh, number of vehicles that we've had to, to enable to deliver services across neighbourhood services, BMS uh, and transportation. Um, we've had been faced with increasing costs of parts 
Uh, so whether we are um, undertaking repairs and maintenance internally or as when external, the parks costs have went up through COVID, through Brexit, through Suez Canal, through whatever means uh, the, the, the price of parts has gone up. Uh, all this while we have a significant and legal obligation to maintain our vehicles in line with our own licence requirements of which the Traffic Commissioner is very quite rightly strict on. Um, so we have had to put out a number of vehicles, uh, more than we've, we've ever done, to maintain the service delivery uh, across uh, mainly waste, roads uh, and transportation and limited land and building maintenance service. We have looked to rectify that. We have went out to advert several times in this period. We have managed to recruit one mechanic. Um, several other adverts that have been out have been not fruitful. Um, and we currently have advert out for two mechanics just now. I have accelerated the service review for the operational side within neighbourhood services, which have done roads uh, maintenance to deliver the capital uh, resurfacing programme. Uh, and I've had to bring forward, I can't wait for uh, the management here to be recruited to, and that is ongoing just now um, to try and encourage people into uh, Mid Lothian Council as a mechanic and provide it as a career destination of choice and a career path with it. Um, but well, as I say, in terms of the, the expenditure that's going uh, in order to maintain our um, services across the council, it's not just one service that is implicated when you're dealing with fleet, it implicates all services that require the vehicles to deliver their services. Thank you. So multiple factors there. Uh, Councillor Milligan. Yeah, th thanks, Provost. I, I, I mean, Thanks, Kevin, for bringing this forward. Uh, um, the cross party working in the business transformation steering groups managed in the last few years to, to, to work hard to bring in balanced budgets. And I'm just looking for assurance for yourself that what the, with these slight alterations and changes and, and offsets that you're happy that you'll still be able to bring in, that this will be a realistic and be able to bring in the budget at, um, on, on level. Um, one of the areas, Kevin, that, that I'm just looking for further assurance on, and it might be Fiona uh, Robertson that needs to give me this, is we always talk about the one of the offsets being the, the, the projection of pupil numbers um, lo lower than what we had anticipated. I think we had also all we've all seen the building trade slowed to a halt, in fact, ground to a halt in some places, uh, and that's probably one of the main reasons that we've not seen the house build that we had expected to, to see at this stage. But we all know that's taken off with a vengeance uh, and is likely to pick up. Are we are we are we certain that the, the five hundred seventy three thousand pound offset there will still be that at the end of the year or if building uh, um, works uh, and pick up again? Um, will, will that uh, uh, um, be an overestimate because we want to make sure that, that the budgets are coming in balance? I also want to, to, to make sure that we're, we're talking to your colleagues in the IGB um, regarding our winter planning to make sure that we're planning properly here. Um, one of the most important things we're going to have to make sure here is we're in a position uh, um, to, to ensure that there's no bed blocking over the winter. The health service is going to be under enough pressure without there being people stuck in hospital. So I'm hoping that officers are talking cross course with the IGB to make sure that, that the support needed there to make sure there are care packages not available to get people out of hospitals critical and it will never have been more critical than what is going to be uh, um, this year and I just look for assurances that that, that, that that kind of work has been been done to make sure that the budgets uh, um, are aligned to that as well. Thank you. Can we start with Kevin? Uh, Professor, I'll defer to Fiona on the education question and Derek on the winter planning. Certainly we had that experience last year and we'd expect to replicate it again, but he can speak to the detail of that. Thank you. Uh, Fiona, in terms of care packages in the winter. Fiona, the education the education, sorry, promised. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. In terms of the um the school roles, we are um just revisiting the school roles across the learning estate because you are quite right, we have to monitor that given there has there was a slowdown in terms of the housing developments, but that has been changing over the summer period. So we did see some of our primary schools and one secondary school in particular, see a number of an increase in, in 
um, number of children and young people enrolling at the start of the new academic session. So we will monitor it very carefully. In terms of that um, fall, can I just say that in terms of the size of the, the, the school estate, that that's almost you know, a, a child per school. So it's not really that significant. Um, so we will have to monitor it very carefully to ensure that that, that um, saving that was identified will track through the financial year. Okay, so the pupil product issue not really going to help us very much considering it bounced up uh, hitherto. And there was the other the other point on care packages. Uh, does anyone want to talk to that? Provost Jay, that was in terms of the forward planning um, yes. to make sure again the winter service is responsive. Right. Hello, thank you. Uh, Morag Barrow. Hello, Morag. Hi there. Yeah, we are we're planning already. Winter planning has been in um, place really since May, so we are just about to pull our um, full plan together. We anticipate it will be done by the second week in January in February. Sorry, in September. Um, but as um, Kevin alluded to, we did um, a kind of one council plan last year where we joined up the health and social care plan with place as well, and it worked really well. So we'll have exactly the same approach. I believe Derek's plan is in draft as well. And we'll pull together. We'll set up the meeting infrastructure that takes us over Christmas to make sure we're monitoring our performance performance and we'll be doing everything we can again to, to support the NHS in terms of, as Derek says, bed blockages. We've got some um, good plans in place, but um, Derek raises a good point. The NHS is under significant pressure just now and it's August, so um, we anticipate it's going to be tougher than it's been for a good few years. Councillor Muirhead. Thanks, Provost. Um, I absolutely agree with Derek. His point there about making sure that we have adequate budget and to deal with uh, growing populations in terms of education, you know that there's maybe it looks like there may have been slightly less than we had expected. Fiona talks about um, we'll continue to monitor um, the situation. How how proactive is that monitoring? Is it is it, are we monitoring historically, or is there an element of anticipation in that, Fiona? For instance. What work do we do to liaise with house builders across Midlothian as to what their expectation is to the, on the number of houses that will be completed in the course of the next the next year, and therefore have an idea, or you know, if it's really ramping up, um, have an idea of how many additional um, youngsters that might be might be uh, presenting to your schools as a result of that. Thank you, Councillor Muirhead. I can confirm that we have um, new strategic boards in place. We have a Children and Young People in Partnerships Learning Estate Board. Membership of that comes um, from across the place directorate as well as education. We had our meeting on Monday and the housing agenda was discussed in terms of the developments that are about to commence the pupil project that we're anticipating from those housing developments and any decrease or increase in the numbers that we've seen from other housing developments in the area. So we meet on a monthly basis. And again, the, the new heads of development from the place directorate do provide an update on um, each of the catchment areas, housing developments that are um, being built out and the implications for education, because we must make sure that we have an education solution um, for the families that are moving into these new housing developments. Thank you on that. Um, that concludes, I think, the contribution from the floor. Uh, we're now moving to item 8.6, the General Services Capital Plan, as it's uh, nearly one o'clock i think we could take this and then have a, have a break for 10 minutes that would be good uh kevin thank you provost um so the report here is giving an update in terms of the general services capital plan uh also the additions for approval in section three of the report and the projection of performance against the budget which is in section four and a general update in terms of the capital fund in section five in 4.1 for the 21-22 budget, there's the rephasing of the project expenditure budgets detailed there, uh, as had been reported to Council in June. That results in an in-year borrowing requirement of uh, just short of 23 million, uh, with the performance against that budget indicated in Table 2. The impact on the level of borrowing for 21-22, as I say, is uh, just short of 23 million. 
based on that forecast expenditure and the funding levels uh, of the programme as detailed there. Section five for the uh, capital plan uh, itself in terms of the balance in the table at the 1st of April 21, uh, just over 24 million. So there is that over commitment at this stage and the impact of COVID has been influencing the rephasing assumptions clearly. Uh, and laterally, we are also now starting to see issues with material supply chain um, and the labour workforce, which has been refugees in some of the earlier debates. Uh, again, colleagues, a uh, range of accountants are available to answer any specific questions, Provost. Thank you. OK, so the clear risk warning here that costs may be more than we thought and also projects have traditionally been much later than we thought in terms of completion. Uh, any comments from the floor? And we have the cash resources to do this. Do we need to do any fresh borrowing? Uh, not at this time, Provis, is my understanding. OK, so for noting, and a lot of this is familiar from previous presentations. Councillor Johnston. Thank you. If there's going to be um, supply challenges, <coughs> uh, are we going to then reorganise our priorities uh, to do some work or are we just going to hope for the best? Well, you, the inference of your question is absolutely correct, Councillor Johnson. We would need to re-evaluate uh, our priorities. Uh, and again, that's part of the, the environment in which we need to have that discussion and debate at the member seminar that we, we entered into the agenda today on to take account of those external influences uh, and understand clearly what members' priorities are uh, as well in the delivery programme. Thank you. Okay, I'm sure we'll come on to this topic after the break when we look at the uh, housing revenue account and the pace of, of house building. Uh, there being no further contributors at this stage, uh, can I suggest that we uh, resume at uh, 10 past 12, which gives just under 15 minutes. 10 past 12, thank you all very much.
and Housing Revenue Account on page 65 of your pack. Kevin. Thank you, Provost. So the uh, report before you is a summary of the expenditure and income across the uh, Housing Revenue Account to the period of the 5th of July of this year. Uh, within Appendix C to the report, this is the capital plan element for the funding and the expenditure uh, within the year, which is projected to just short of 60 million. Uh, at present, the, this is based on the production of 287 units. We did report to Council in April with a housing update uh, paper that 346 uh, units were on site in construction at that time. Within the revenue count aspect, which is detailed in Appendix D, the, uh, there is a uh, underspend of uh, 692,000 being reported, and that's attributed clearly to the reduction in anticipated repairs and maintenance as a consequence of the restrictions of COVID. Uh, the borrowing costs in relation to the, the programme and the impact clearly of rent collection levels which have been reported previously uh, and now accounted for in this paper. The um, members may be aware that there is a work piece going on in terms of reconciliation across the HRA and unit numbers. Uh, this has been requested through the audit committee uh, and it may be beneficial to bring that forward to October Council similarly uh, to, to give the same report. Otherwise, promised the report is in respect of noting. Thank you. Well, thanks very much for that. And I think it's absolutely essential we have a report on this. Uh, the audited accounts of the Council to March 2020 were picked up at the Audit Committee. We'd spent 18 million on the uh, new houses there, but only 29 had actually appeared. And I realise there's purchase of housing, the splitting of housing that we just discussed. Uh, if I read these numbers correctly, we went up in the audited year to March 21 to 119 houses. But this seems to indicate we're by March we're falling back quite seriously. I, I work it out at 76 houses. And your report says we're uh, we're under by uh, 207 in terms of the total total stock. Now maybe it's okay. We've got a huge build up of work in progress, but I don't think councillors have any grasp of whether the work in progress is correctly valued or uh, more important still, what are the con contract costs to completion for our ambitious uh, build programme? Uh, and it may well be with the problems you've mentioned on uh, labour and on materials that we're actually going to struggle to uh, achieve this you know, central policy of Midlothian Council. So I very much welcome a report uh, as soon as possible at the October meeting reconciling our audited statements to the sort of numbers that you've got here and assuring us that we're not facing uh, a really quite big disappointment, fundamental disappointment in, in this project. Councillor Johnston. Thank you very much. Uh, the revenue account, I just wondered what our rent collection performance was during this period and what percentage of the rent is uh, still uncollected and how is that benchmarking or, or comparing to other similar organisations? Kevin Anderson. Yes, thanks Councillor Johnson. So there was a write-off of rent related debt and certainly the rent um, collection has been adversely affected through COVID unlike the council tax collection rate I have to uh, advise. Uh, so there was uh, 197,000 uh, was the last value equating to, to the write-off. Uh, in percentage terms, I'm sorry, I don't have that to hand. Um, I did ask for that before coming into council, but I don't have it, so I can respond to that separately to you. Uh, thank you, I would appreciate to know that I, because I mean, a lot of the um, house building, etc., is predicated on how well we uh, collect the rent so we can prepare for the future. It's quite an important aspect of having being a landlord. Indeed. Further contributions? I think quite a lot hangs on the report that's coming to the October meeting. Uh, we therefore move on. Having made those points to the environmental enforcement paper, item 8.8. .8. Uh, I think this is uh, Derek, Derek Oliver. Good afternoon, thank you, Provost. Good afternoon, councillors. Uh, the report before you focuses and seeks the mitigation and scoping of alternative enforcement opportunities for environmental offences, including fly tipping, dog fouling, littering, graffiti and abandoned vehicles. 
legislation is more restricted in Scotland compared to other parts of the United Kingdom in terms of being able to utilise the services of private enforcement agencies for environmental offences. With environmental health resources uh, stretched nationally in terms of the workforce and entry to the profession, much like uh, mechanics, but also due to COVID response and other priorities set by the UK and Scottish governments. Environmental offences and the regulation requires an alternative means of delivery. It is proposed that a fully costed options appraisal for enforcement is brought to Council for consideration. This will also inform and be informed by the creation of a robust environmental crime strategy developed in partnership with local groups and individuals, creating a visible enforcement service to tackle environmental crime, which is cost efficient, sustainable and proportionate, ensuring our wider communities are informed about the importance of maintaining a clean, green local environment. This will include service standards, prioritise timescales for responding to reports and also create a suite of intervent interventions for the Council to combat environmental crime. Um, zero, oh, sorry. Um, Tackling litter and fly tipping is also an integral part of achieving net zero waste society, a society where the value of resources is recognised, we use or reuse them more efficiently and where they are recycled rather than thrown away, retaining value in Scotland's economy. Environmental crime imposes financial costs on local government uh, from uplift to disposal, but also indirect costs to agriculture and marine life, as well as, as, well as the blight on our landscape. Recognising and embracing the fantastic voluntary work by community groups and individuals, it is vital to involve this representation in a coordinated approach to ensure the Council is facilitating and supporting these efforts as far as is possible. It is proposed that a forum of the Midlothian Neighbourhood and Environmental Improvement Group would provide a single point of contact for Council response and participation. It is also proposed that this group also covers engagement and involvement in groups contributing to the aesthetics of towns and public open spaces, including weeding and planting of flowers and identifying key strategic points for the Council and areas for adoption, as it were, by these groups. When working together, we can collaborate on scoping environmental improvement funding applications to deliver um, improved and enhanced local environments with our neighbourhood services. Performance on enforcement, Meeting uh, objectives of the strategy is proposed to be reported and included in a protective services briefing to the police and fire and rescue board uh, on a regular basis. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I think you all know that the police fire and rescue board had a very extensive session on this subject uh, just a, a month or two ago. Uh, Councillor Parry. Thanks, Provost. Yeah, I absolutely welcome um, you know any efforts to tackle um, fly tipping um, and litter in our communities. It's an absolute blight and I'm sure um, it affects all of us. Um, so I really welcome um, the, the recommendations to do something. However, I did just want to query um, in the first recommendations, uh, there, there's obviously going to be a, a cost appraisal for the utilis utilisation of contractors um, to carry out this work. And I wondered why we wouldn't just um, directly employ uh, people from Midlothian to do this work in Midlothian's communities and um, they know I think one of the criticisms um, that's often made around um, community groups not criticism of their work is that they're essentially doing uh, the job that, that the council tax um, pays for which I think is a perfectly valid opinion to have and to go even further and to see this being essentially privatised um, is a bit disappointing so it would be good if there was an explanation for that Derek. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. Um, it's really just to be, because the, the, the query uh, to look at um, the, the other uh, means of enforcement in other parts of the UK where private agencies are being used and if, to scope that in, whether that was something that we could do in Midlothian. Um, in response, the, the legislation, there are slight differences within it, so that isn't an option as a direct. However, um, what we can do is use contractors. That was just purely as an option. We can also cost appraise uh, the, the employment of um, officers. The one thing I would say, though, is with regards to uh, environmental crime, it's very different from um, 
the, the, the community groups going out and enhancing the local area. Um, from one for, for going out and doing liquor, li, li, litter picking, sorry, um, to actually engaging with a perpetrator is two very different things. And if you're from the local area, as well as maybe knowing people, it can be a deterrent from actually apprehending, as it were, a perpetrator uh, and, and doing so. Um, so it was really just to, to put that the options that are there, that we can go out to um, have people external from the council employment uh, to do it, and in doing so, they could do it on a performance related basis of which they are paid, and that's something that we can look at on a contractual. So if they're actually incentivized to be going out and searching um, across the wards in terms of any uh, offences that are being created, um, then that may help in terms of the uh, surveillance monitoring and uh, enforcement of these offences. But that's that can be fleshed out further in the, the follow paper. Thank you. And Councillor Emery, then Councillor Cassidy. Yeah, th thanks very much, Provost. Uh, I also welcome the, the report. Uh, I mean, it's uh, it's been a long time due. We, we go through these campaigns and uh, we try and alert people to uh, do the right thing. However, it's not just in Midlothian, it's right throughout society that people uh, tend to, dare I say, bend the rules. Uh, and I'll put it, I'll put it just lightly like, like that. But I, I really do think that one of the recommendations about the, the neighbourhood uh, group, uh, what we've seen uh, in, in particular, something that I think is 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 doable, and I, I think, Provis, what we've seen um, over the last, uh, I've got to say, a couple of years, it feels like that. I know it's only eighteen months, but uh, uh, what what we've certainly seen over that time is because people were going out and about in the landscape that they've seen the state of the area that they live in, and they've probably never noticed that before. And what it has done is it's brought so many volunteers forward to say, you know what, we care about our community and perhaps we've been taking things for granted. Now, while, while I welcome the, 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 the use of a, a neighbourhood service and how it will be streamlined into that, I do think, though, we've got to be very flexible, Provis, because uh, we all know that groups Groups will spring up uh, when, when there's a particular problem and they might be active for that, uh, that point in time, but they might not stay active. They might go passive again and then come back again at another time. So I don't want to dissuade these people from coming, coming forward. And uh, I really do think that as a joined up council, looking at uh, our protective services on one hand, because as Derek says, they have a different job to do uh, very much to uh, a volunteer. A volunteer is not going to actually go up there and start challenging somebody, or they might do, but they might not. They might need a, a, a 999 call after that. Who knows? But whereas our protective services people have won the, the, the ammunition, and, and I don't mean that in a, in a horrible way, they actually have the authority not the ammunition, the authority to go and do something about it. And I think that the, the biggest challenge and difficult one for all of us is fly tipping. Um, I can, you know, I, I can see us going ahead and doing the, the dog fouling thing, the litter picking side of, of things. That, 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 that's doable, but fly tipping province on public land and private land is so hard to get a hold of the perpetrators. And I do think somehow, and it's not for today's uh, debate and discussion, but I do think it, it, it's unfortunate that if it goes on to private land, the private owner is responsible financially as well as for the, the mess it makes to get that uh, moved. And I do think somehow the law doesn't actually reflect on you know, the, the individual that is the owner of that particular land who, through no fault of their own, has ended up with um, with fly tipping on their land. So I do think we certainly need to look at that. But I, I'll conclude by saying that, you know, don't let's lose what we've gained over the last 18 months with our communities. It's important that we 
one, thank them for what they've done, but also engage with them further to see if they want to take on some more responsibilities. And I know Councillor Parry says, oh, you know, people say it's, you know, we pay our council tax and we, we, we you know, we should get it done. And I, it's an easy, it's an easy one to say, but the reality is that communities have a role and responsibility for their communities and to take pride in where they live and where they, how they go about their daily business. So Provis, welcome the report. Obviously, there's there's work to come back, work to be done, and work and, and no doubt recommendations to come back. But at least we're now starting starting the journey, and I think most communities will be very thankful that Midlothian's taking heed of what they've been doing over the last eighteen months. Thank you very much, Provost. Yeah, certainly we need fresh ideas from whatever department, and also there's a whole question of a social media which is turning out to be so powerful in the matter of identifying fly tipping. Councillor Casty, then Councillor Hackett, and then I promise Councillor McKenzie. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Provost. Uh, I, I, well, you'll be no surprise to hear I warmly welcome this uh, paper and the work that Derek and his uh, group are putting uh, bringing this to Council today. <clears throat> I also agree with a lot of the stuff that Councillor uh, Parry and Councillor Imri have uh, touched on here. Um, the, the one thing I'd say is we have to change the mindset of the people in Midlothian. And that mindset touches on something Russell was saying, and it's about people's attitude. It's the council will do it, the council. We have we did become a bit of a nanny state for a long time, but that mindset is slowly changing. The one step I'd take further is give people ownership of areas. We have 350 people at the last count looking for uh, areas to grow vegetables for allotments. We have areas in car parks, we have areas in parks, that we're spending money cutting, we can't afford to plant, put plants in them anymore. We need to start looking at giving them over to communities and say, grow your vegetables there, you look after that, and that's when the real transformation will come. So I, I warmly welcome this. I, I think Derek's done a fantastic job. His team have stepped up to the plate. As most of you know, I'm a volunteer and go nearly every Sunday trying to keep my town tidy in the surrounding area. And the help that we've had from the council, from Derek's department, has been phenomenal. So I'd like to recommend this paper and also thank Derek for his contributions. And then Councillor Hackett and Councillor McKenzie. Councillor Hackett. Thank you, Provost. Yeah, um, so along similar lines, drawing out those two differences between uh, uh, a, a rural crime, as it were, uh, fly tipping and, and other things. And I think um, I agree with the sentiments around contracting. You know, um, I hope we pick those up actually when we're discussing the issue of the National Care Service, because that still includes commissioning, which was forced upon us by the Scottish Government, forcing hundreds, well, in fact, across the country, thousands of women um, from council employment into the private care sector under cutting wages and conditions. But that's um, a different matter. But in terms of how we deliver uh, a service here in Midlothian. I think it's right that we look at contracted services. We have a depleted team here, but I would want to see an in-house bid, as it were. What is it that we could do to employ local people? But we should uh, leave no stone unturned when we're trying to tackle fly tipping. I particularly appreciate the joint effort as well with Police Scotland and the fire service. Certainly as cabinet member, one of the first things I did was meet with Police Scotland um, to discuss fly tipping um, and get a better understanding of how that's dealt with. It'd also be good to see this as an opportunity to look at new ways of tackling fly tipping. So technology that was historically quite restrictive, you look at mobile cameras and things like that now are really, really cheap. Um, but then at the same time, we have things like, I think, is it called RIPSA, you know, the surveillance laws and things like that that might be restrictive. But again, I think it's really important that we use this as an opportunity to explore all those options. Um, and again, in particular with the you know our neighbourhood areas and people volunteering, you know practically speaking, if I'm right, it was the land and services manager that has been responding to volunteer groups, and I think that was fine when there was a handful of them here or there across the county. But as we've all seen, there's groups springing up all over the place, putting a huge deal of pressure on that one individual staff member. But as has been discussed here, you want the council to be welcoming when people are picking up the phone. You don't want to be on a list of waiting for 
I mean, are other jobs to be done before being contacted. So the feedback's been very good. You know, Colin's uh, feedback there from Derek and his team, I think it has been excellent what we've been able to do, but we need to be able to sustain that um, and grow it. And I think it fits very neatly into the neighbourhood services redesign that we're looking at, which again, it's about neighbourhood services being delivered locally in better partnership with local communities and where that is being successful. You know, I was out at um, Gore Bridge where they've opened the, the We Skate ramp there. Um, and what Ellen Scott and the team up there get up to in partnership with the council is just extraordinary. Um, and there's examples of that right across the county. So it's how do we do that, um, do it more and do it better. Thank you, Provost. Thank you for that contribution. Uh, Councillor McKenzie, Councillor Johnson, then Councillor Winchester. Thank you, Provost. Um, one wee word of caution from me, and uh, broadly I would agree with a lot of what's been said, but I always think there's a reason why councils were formed. So as I read some of that paper, it said we want to put more onus on community groups, and that's absolutely fantastic. And if we lived in a perfect world, that would work perfectly. However, I think the council, we need to recognise that there might be areas within Midlothian where community groups don't rise to the challenge. So I would hate to think that in 24 months, 36 months, we're, we're looking around at particular areas, looking at the mess. So Derek, I would, there's some excellent work here, Derek, and I would just ask you to, you know, be cognizant of the fact of if the communities don't rise to the challenge, maybe we do need sort of hit squads to get in there and, and you know, do the necessary. Um, but that wasn't the point I was going to make. I just want to ask about points 5.2, maybe 6.1, 6.2, Derek. Tell me what's going to look different about this proposed new forum or the, the Neighbourhood and Environmental Improvement Group. Because at the moment, I think that there's already maybe a bit of bureaucracy. And my worry is that this is going to be an additional level of bureaucracy. Um, so if, I'll give you a for instance. I wanted to get some bin bags for a community group litter pick. Um, I got right through to the right person first time. Fantastic. They put me onto the website, six page website in order to get two bobs worth of black bins. So is this going to reduce bureaucracy? And if so, how? Thank you. Uh, thank you. The, the, the forum uh, itself or the or the group is, you, know, you said in your opening remark about putting the onus on community groups. This isn't about putting the onus on community groups. It's about listening to community groups and, and learning from them. And tying in what other councillors have said is um, areas of adoption. We want to hear areas where they want to take um, primacy, as it were, and, and controlling weeds and, and enhancing the area and doing litter picks, etc. And us working with them. So it's, it's providing that platform. So instead of speaking to a number of different people from waste, environmental health, to land, uh, to even roads in some circumstances, there's a single point of contact and it's worked remarkably well for the safety advisory group. So anybody that wants to have an event, instead of going to licensing, instead of going to land, if they're, they're booking uh, or hiring a piece of our, our land or public land uh, or environmental health for food, etc, 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 there's a single focal point. So it cuts through the bureaucracy. And listening to what you just said about filling out a form, we need to hear that to then change it. So if someone's hearing it from land, they make land slightly better, um, then it's still not having the implications that we want from a one council approach. So really it is to cut through the bureaucracy, it is to cut through all these number of, or the user journey for where you eventually get the black bags, is to provide that single point of contact and a much more effective and efficient service in return. And at the same time, feeling as though that we are a listening organisation and it's not being passed off or you need to go to a, a, a councillor as it were, is that the council as a neighbourhood services are bringing the frontline operational services to, together to listen to you as a community group or you as an individual to see what we can do for your community. And I'm all for that, Derek, if, if that's your aim. Is that almost in my head, are you saying there would be one person and you know, in my area, I go and speak to John or Jean regularly, and they cover a whole gambit of council services. But I only see one face. Only need to see one face. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah, that'd be a huge plus for a lot of community councils. Uh, Councillor Johnston, then Councillor Winchester. Thanks. I, I would agree with Stuart. That form you have to fill in online to get two hoops and ten bags is a nightmare. 
And why do you have to do it every single time when it's an established thing? You're doing it at the last Saturday in the month that you're always going to be needing this stuff and et cetera. I, because you're a repeat customer. So that should be taken into account as well. The other thing I was going to ask, I don't think it's really necessarily the council's role to clear up after clerks that go around littering and dumping stuff in our um, society. I mean, I think there's something to do with educating the folk who do that, but I don't know how you do that. Maybe we should have some kind of competition about designing posters or get a community involvement and uh, so that we can have a beautiful county to live in and maybe teaching children at school. I mean, that's maybe saying the obvious, but in their social uh, studies, could there be some thing about how dangerous littering is, how dangerous it is to waste water, how dangerous it is to dump stuff in the sea, flush down the toilet, etc. I mean, Scottish Water are always putting down stuff about what you should put down the toilet and stuff like that. So why is the council not in getting involved in that? Um, council has a, a community engagement officer in Waste who does go around schools, um, unfortunately due to the COVID the pandemic, uh, and it's not an excuse but there's a reason, um, that obviously hasn't managed to take place uh, over the, the last 18 months but it will go back uh, where we do engage with, with our school children uh, and pupils and try and put the, the message out. Unfortunately we do, um, I, I, understand the sentiment about why should we, but um, there is a duty under us uh, and a code of practice um, for littering that we need to keep our areas clear and there are certain parameters about when an area for a town centre compared to residential streets need to be cleared and in what time scale. So we are bound by them that we have to clear up after the collapse, as you put it. Thank you, thank, you. thank you very much, Derek, but I just think we should widen it. It shouldn't just be schools that we go into. We should be going in, I don't know, the sheltered housing complexes, churches, I don't know, local uh, grown up organisations, football clubs. Maybe we should really embrace the whole community and not just school the school community. OK, okay one, one for the blackboard there, uh, Derek, uh, to think about. Uh, Councillor Winchester and then Councillor Hackett. Thanks, Provost. Derek, just a, a change of direction slightly here. Are there any plans to widen the hours that the recycling centres are open? Um, only the fact that they're closing at four o'clock and um, they, they're not available out with any normal working hours for, for a lot of people in Midlothian. Thank you. Um, yes, uh, is the, the short answer. I'm, I'm looking at various working patterns across neighbourhood services again to best serve uh, our communities and that's wider than waste. It's also land um, and roads as well. So yes is the short answer and that will be um, consulted on in the coming weeks. Thank you for that. It's always frustrating for gardeners to have to finish their work on an afternoon at three o'clock to get there for four. Uh, Councillor Hackett, then, then uh, the leader, Derek Milligan. Thanks, Provost. You can always uh, go to the recycling centre at the weekend, so there's that option as well. But I take that point on board and I've asked for a long time about exploring um, one or two nights a week, um, late night opening to allow that to happen. But just in terms of some of the comments, I agree with the point that where you do have volunteers, um, you know, you will see an improved area. That's why people do it. They want to roll their sleeves up and make their town uh, look better. Certainly there's parts of my ward where I'll just be honest, that's just never going to happen. Um, there are areas where there are communal bin stores, et cetera, which are just a constant eyesore. And I know a lot of work's been done, um, you know, not just because of this paper, but um, looking at at that issue, but I think it's important to note while we're talking about these things about resources, you know, all of this stuff costs money. I think um, Derek Oliver and the other manage the rest of the management team have done exceptional in terms of delivering vastly improved outputs by looking at doing things differently, changing the way staff operate, taking new people on board. But all of that has its limit, and as local government just continues to get cut year after year after year, these are the consequences of these cuts. Is services will um, either get cut, cut back or stopped altogether and it's important that as we recover from the pandemic that the local government doesn't become another um, area for uh, Scottish government cuts which it has sadly been for the last 10 years. Thank you. 
Thank you. And then uh, Councillor Milligan. Thanks, brother. Brother, yeah, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm really happy to see the report forward uh, um, and, and completely endorse all the, 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 uh, the statements about our voluntary groups. But I, I think I'm wanting to be even just a wee bit more frank. Uh, um, we were talking about the council. Since I've been a councillor in 1999, dog fouling, fly tipping and littering have been top of the feedback for the public and about the failure of this council in tackling it. Successive councils right across the board have tried to come to grips with this and quite frankly, we've failed. We've absolutely failed. Dog fouling has to be the top of most councillors talked about lists in every single year and about the lack of enforcement on it. When you look at the, 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 the work done by the, the, the private sector in Northern Ireland and England, um, you're quite clearly seeing that it's having a fantastic effect. And just to take the point about do we employ local people with that, I mean, we've got parking enforcement now privatised and effectively, this is, unless I'm reading it wrong, Derek, a very similar way to bring in the, the, the private sector or us be able to consider the private sector um, to, to do this enforcement. And certainly the ones I'm looking at, um, Derek, it seems to be that this is at no cost to the taxpayer. And unless I'm reading it wrong, that's certainly what seems to be happening. So in other words, they have to enforce it. They have to make sure and catch the people that are fly tipping, that are littering, that are, that are, are allowing their dogs to fill, um, for it to be successful. And it seems to be successful. So I think it's important that whilst, yep, we should have um, some form um, coming back to us on uh, um, whether we can do it internally or no. I would also like to see what the results of that are. And maybe, Derek, if we could maybe get some examples brought back if where councils are maybe successfully tackling it themselves and other councils who've brought in the private sector to tackle it have, have been successful. But certainly for, for my workload, dog fowl and fly tipping and littering are always right up there. Thank you, for, thank you for that. Obviously, there are questions about you know, the training of those who work for us and making sure that data protection is, is observed, uh, but that will be part of the paper that's uh, predicted uh, if we make the decision to go forward on this basis. Uh, Councillor Alexander, then Councillor Cassidy. Uh, Sorry, yes, um, good afternoon. Um, as a person that used to go to um, France and Italy uh, back in the early 80s. And um, I, I remember the streets there being just full of dog litter. Um, and when you go back now, you see that these places are absolutely beautiful. There's very little, in fact, no dog littering. Um, litter itself isn't, people just don't do it. And I would like to see what they have done. And I think a lot of it, instead of actually bringing in um, fines, etc., which we don't have the people, even if we um, employ people from outside, are we actually going to have enough people to cover the whole of Midlothian and to deal with the problem? Because when you you know, once people know, oh, well, there's there's um, officers in, in one place, they'll move to another, they'll fly tip in another or whatever. So I think we need to look to do things to actually stop it happening in the first place. And I think that by empowering um, local groups such as the, um, the Dalkeith Gorilla Gardeners, etc., and bringing back pride in our communities, is the way forward and perhaps we should look at actually putting that money that we would spend in enforcement into our communities um, to help them bring a pride back in themselves. Um, and so my first protocol would be to see what other people are doing in other countries as well as um, what we're doing in England, etc. So for me, it's empowerment rather than enforcement. So, so look at everything for the guerrilla gardeners short, short of actually giving them arms. Um, let's think more about how we can empower them. Uh, Councillor Cassidy and then Councillor Hackett. Yes, thank you, 
uh, Provost, that uh, I'm going to go back to what Councillor Milligan was saying, and I agree 100% with him. We have failed catastrophically in this area to deal with this problem. And just as an example, my wife's from Belfast. I was at wedding in Belfast two years ago. I dropped a bit of paper in my back pocket, a bus ticket by mistake, and one of the members of the public came running over and told, you'll get found £30 for that, you better pick that up. Now, they have wardens going around Belfast. I hadn't been to Belfast for eight years. Eight years prior to that, I was discussing with the state of the streets. There was dog mess, there was chewing gum, there was litter everywhere. They changed it by bringing in wardens. Now, I don't care if these wardens come from the moon. I don't care if they're private, they're public, they're whoever. As long as they are keeping our streets clean, and it goes back to what Councillor Alexander was saying, we need to change the mindset. And I don't agree with her. I don't think it's encouragement. I think it is enforcement. I think we need to be strict with these people and they need to learn a lesson. They're running amok in our town centres and getting away with it. And it needs to stop. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure I'm not the only councillor sometimes to be embarrassed by the state of the council car park. Uh, councillor Hackett. Oh, sorry, Provost. Legacy hand. Apologies. Councillor Cassidy, also Legacy Hand. Uh, do I take it that we have uh, the intention of making the decision to support these recommendations? Councillor uh, Councillor oh. McKenzie. So, sorry, Provost, I popped that up just when you were looking aside to, to look at something else. Um, just one sort of very quick question for, for Derek, if I may, and it's just a very practical question, so it shouldn't take long. Derek, would we consider for the fly tip in using um, automated number plate recognition? Because I believe that some local councils across the UK have done that. I don't know if there's any specific legislation in Scotland that says you can't do that. Oh, you can. Um, the, the couple of uh, redeployable uh, wireless CCTV units that we have um, have ANPR, autom automatic number plate recognition, on it. Um, and one of them is currently deployed at a fly tipping hotspot. So, yeah, we are able to. Super. Thanks, Derek. Yeah, thanks. That's, a, that's good to know. Um, we therefore, I think, now move on to a kind of related question. Thank you, uh, Councillor McKenzie. Uh, closed circuit television uh, network. Uh, this is item 8.9 on page 78. Uh, and it's a report for decision and Kevin Anderson. Again, Provost. Um, Councillors, uh, CCTV provision is not a statutory function of the local authority. Um, and it's acknowledged that the system will not solve or eliminate all crime. However, it is an effective tool helping to reduce the fear of crime enabling the collection of real time information to assist with investigations and the apprehending and prosecuting of offenders and of course increasing public safety and reassurance. The public space CCTV system inventory of 56 cameras in Midlothian is deteriorating with 16 units now non operational. With engagement with Police Scotland, it is proposed that officers undertake a fully costed options appraisal on the existing estate and network and any additional equipment to meet the objectives of a CCTV system, uh, scoped by a re-established CCTV officers group and a review of the code of practice on CCTV operations, with performance again reported to the Police and Fire and Rescue Board as part of a protective services briefing. Thank you for that. Councillor Curran, then Councillor Cassidy. Thanks, Provost. See, the Police and Fire and Rescue Board are going to be even busier. Um, Provost, just to quickly, just to move the recommendations and hope that a fully costed option and appraisal will come forward as soon as possible. Yeah, yeah I sense technology is, is, is moving forward and actually in a more cost effective way. Uh, Councillor Cassidy. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, I agree with Councillor Curran. We need to get this moving as quickly as possible. But the one caveat I have there is that we get the police to work in conjunction with us with the problems we're having in our town centres and our villages and our wherever, because they, I, I just, I'm not going to go over it, but everyone will have seen the social media over the weekend, what was going on in Dalkeith and the response from the police. I know there was a incident in Gorebridge, I've heard all about it, but it, people were in a state of fear in Dalkeith on Sunday afternoon 
and that should not be happening. We had no police presence whatsoever two hours after I called it in, and we have t CCTV there. I hope that the police can go and look at that and identify these culprits who were urinating in public in front of women and children, who were giving abuse to people and generally putting our town in a state of fear. So I warmly welcome the, the introduction of new cameras into our town centres. Thank you. Thank you for that. And the Police Fire and Rescue Board will no doubt be touching on what, what's happened there. Uh, Councillor Russell. Uh, Marco, you're on mute, I think. There we are. Just the noticed. Uh, thank you, Provost. Obviously, echoing um, my, my other um, Dalkey councillors, uh, there are obviously lots of issues in lots of towns um, that this new CCTV cameras will, uh, will address. Um, and for my mind, it can't come quick enough. And that's my intervention as uh, you've papered here today. Um, we're costing it. We haven't got a time frame for it being costed. And I would really like to sign priority and being given to this based on what Colin was, was identifying. Um, the other town centre, there are a lot of public houses in our town area. Um, and hence that sometimes causes a lots of problems. But I do welcome this report and, and I welcome the work that's went into preparing this report from Derek and his team. But I'm asking, I'm insisting that we do get a time frame for this and that would be much appreciated. Thank you. Uh, Derek, are you able to respond on that so we, we can expect this at a fairly soon council meeting? To I mean, the 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 option of repairing and uh, and or upgrading the existing network, that price can be um, obtained, uh, you know, ahead of the next council meeting. The, the problem is uh, by engaging through, and that's the reason that I wanted to, to sit down with the police, sit down with third sector, housing, social work, etc., and make sure that the strategic points within Midlothian are covered, uh, and then say, well, how much would it be to implement the, you know, the new system or uh, an enhanced system in these locations and provide that as an option. And as well as that is to say, well, we've got the existing state, the existing network, and then where we have um, particular incidents or known incidents that's going to happen up hotspots, whether it's fly tipping, antisocial behaviour, graffiti, etc., we can then deploy the wireless CCTV. How many wireless CCTV do we want to add to our inventory? So the first part is can be done pretty quickly. It's the second part that will take a bit of time. So if I say maybe um, this is August, September, October, um, we could be able to have a um, an informed paper on the CCTV network. So that's for the October 3rd uh, council meeting. Um, <clears throat> it's right at the beginning of October. Are you able to do that, Derek? Oh, it'll be in November then. OK, let's let's play safe in November, but th this kind of has to happen. Uh, and there's also always the question of uh, does it go to our general account or can it be capitalised or could we in areas of social housing use the housing revenue account? Uh, Councillor Johnston, then Councillor Mackenzie. Thank you very much. The, although this is a quite a wee report, it's actually quite a complicated thing and we wanted to cover everything in its granny. So once we've got all that kind of information before we make or take a decision in council, can we have a seminar on that so we all understand the full implications of it? Uh, because as Derek was saying, there's a few choices and we all need to understand exactly what's going on. So I think a timeline for that would be a quick one. Thank you. OK, so this will be in advance of a council meeting when by that stage we pretty much know what we wanted to do. Uh, is that is that possible, Derek, even if there's uh, you know, a few uh, square brackets around the numbers? Yeah, that's fine. So okay. I'm working um, times with the uh, democratic services to you prefer a seminar to taking it through the business transformation steering group, for example, might be an alternative. Be guided by um, democratic services. Kevin. Very good reply. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Mac McKenzie. Thank you very much, Provost. Um, we quite often hear the council say that we want to be responsive to our residents, 
would you be proposing that we go out in some form of consultation and then we ask people where they want CCTV cameras? Um, I'll give you an example of there's some really quite quiet dark lanes that lead from the back of Mayfield down to Newton Grange, for instance. There's no CCT coverage at all. Um, however, we tend to put CCTV in places such as town centres and car parks. So are we saying that we value people's parked cars more than potentially people getting attacked in a dark lane? So would we propose to go out and consult and get each individual community's view on where's the best, most appropriate place for them if we are extending the network? Yeah, I would say that there's also the police information as to where the where the problems are. Uh, Derek Oliver? Sorry, you beat me to it, uh, Provost. That, uh, it's based on the police uh, information on, on deterrence and the, the wider public. So you'll always get uh, small well, areas where an incident may happen. Um, and designing out where that, so if it's small, dark, enclosed areas, we look at increased light in it. Um, so that can act as a deterrent as opposed to putting a, a CCTV camera in where there may be only you know a handful of of uh, pedestrian use compared to many hundreds or thousands of people within using a car park on a weekly basis or uh, on a town centre basis. For so, um, and CCTV is is you know it's not just for um, antisocial behaviour. Um, there's there's other um, means for its use uh, and enforcement, counter terrorism, etc. So, um, it's it's the the biggest bang for your buck in terms of the CCTV network, and I will be guided by um, the police interface. Um, so I would say unless there's anything where something comes through um, for fly tip and hotspots through this new um, Midlothian um, environment group, we could put maybe the wireless CCTV um, provided that there is a lighting column nearby that we can get the, the, the source from. Uh, otherwise, no, it will be a corporate decision based on police guidance. Thank you, Derek. Thank you for that and that therefore concludes on the basis we have a, agreed this report. Uh, we then move to the private section of the agenda uh, and we have to say farewell to all our friends in the media and in the community at this point. Uh, Democratic services, uh, are, are we clear to start this session? Promised advice uh, from the monitoring officer is to uh, go to the private invite.